Welcome to 132 Problems Revisiting Mormon Polygamy, where we explore the scriptural and theological case for plural marriage and now the historical case for Joseph Smith's supposed polygamy. Okay, this is the long-awaited second part of the discussion on William Clayton with Jeremy Hoop. Now, I have to give a little bit of preliminary information. As you, I'm sure, have already seen, this is a very long episode. Um, Jeremy brought a ton of information. Some of you might find this a little bit too in-depth, <laughs> which is just fine. Some of you, I know, will just love everything that is shared. So to try to... Um, reach the entire audience with this incredibly important information. Jeremy is working on getting this presentation down to about 60 to 90 minutes, and we are going to re-record a second version. So for those who want the entire um, three hour and 45 minute discussion, you are in luck. Here it is. For those who feel like this might be a little bit much, I mean, of course, I think there's a ton of valuable information here, but Jeremy is going to go through and, and really choose the most important parts and get it down to what might be a more manageable size for some of you. So if anyone would rather wait, that will be forthcoming. So you will get the information in either case. I think this is an incredibly important topic and episode, either this one or the one that is coming, because in my opinion, Jeremy has just proved that William Clayton's journal cannot be said to be contemporaneous. I know proved is a hard um, word, so maybe I should soften that, but I think that someone would have a very difficult time arguing that William Clayton's journal is contemporaneous after watching this episode and this presentation that he has put together. So I'm so excited that you are here. Buckle up and join us for this incredible deep dive into the journals of William Clayton. Welcome to this long anticipated episode of 132 Problems, long anticipated by Jeremy and, and me as much as anybody else. I have to tell everyone, this is our third time, count them three, we've probably spent already four hours on this episode trying to get it ready. And so now we've got the technology set up, everything should go smoothly. But this is a guy that for my viewers needs no introduction. And Jeremy, I and my audience cannot thank you enough for your long suffering, enduring to the end, <laughs> your patience to get this information out there because it is so important and I'm so excited to hear it again myself and bring it to my audience. So welcome and thank you in advance for all of this. Uh, thanks for having me again. Um, yeah, it, it, this is worth it. I think this, this material is... Um, is really important and uh it's well it's really geeky stuff uh if you're not in the mood to, to listen to something that gets deep into the tall grass in fact goes burrows well beneath the roots of the tall grass um you might want to save this for another day although don't save it just dive in but it's we're gonna get kind of document nerdy here today so that's of all the things I thought I'd geek out about in my life. I didn't know William Clayton was high on the list. Heaven but no. the more you study this, the more important you realize it is. Yeah. Like we have got to study this guy inside out because he's so central to all of this. It's insane. So yeah. it's insane how important this like sad little man turns out to be in this research. So yeah, we can go ahead and dive right in. Okay. I'm excited to, um, to explore this further. Um, uh, if, if people are just joining this, this particular topic, William Clayton, for the first time, and you haven't seen the other pieces that are foundational, we, uh, Michelle and I went through um, things about Brigham Young and Heber Kimball and the things that they were doing whilst in England, the things that they believed in and were practicing at least uh, documentably, is that a word, documentably? <laughs> With uh, Heber Kimball. Um, that's going to become part of the lexicon. Uh, Heber Kimball was absolutely practicing some form of spiritual wifery, um, some form of plurality of wives um, in England, and Brigham Young at least believed in it. And there is some evidence, uh, later tales of him actually practicing it. 
uh, well, adultery of some kind or some kind of loose behavior. We've been having technical difficulties from episode to episode to episode, and we've even had one in this episode. And I think there's some little demon that does not want this information out. So, <laughs> do you know what? It's the it's little Willie. We'll call him little Willie. Little it's little, little, little Willie. <laughs> little Willie is a mischievous, um, <laughs> disembodied spirit. <clears throat> oh, we're going to dissect to dissect little Willie um, today. <laughs> in great detail, parts of Little Willie. Um, and what we're going to focus on today, I think will help people have much greater context to understand this particular piece of the puzzle related to Joseph Smith and polygamy. Um, if you could share my screen. Yes. That would we'll be great. Let's dive get, in. Get started. So we have been talking about um, characters from from the restoration history that are have been less than truthful, truthful, proven to have uh, fabricated stories and to have embellished and to have changed history. So we started off talking about Brigham and Heber and the things that they were doing prior to Joseph Smith supposedly ever saying a word to them about the principle that they came to. Um, love and adore and practice and and that they integrated as what they considered to be the fullness of the gospel, the, the highest principle in the gospel. Brigham and Heber, long story short, were doing these things in England long before Joseph ever supposedly says anything. Well, moving on, we're now talking about William Clayton. William Clayton is a central figure in all of this, primarily uh, because of his journal. And in episode one, we talked about aspects of his journals, his England journal and his Nauvoo journal that revealed a lot about his character. Today, we're going to talk about the journal itself. We're going to dive into the context of the journal so people have an understanding of what they're reading if they read parts of it and why it is that, um, that people consider it to be the smoking gun for Joseph Smith's polygamy and why they shouldn't, frankly. In part three, we're gonna, going to examine aspects of the content of that journal. And then in part four, we're going to talk about consistency, the consistency of the story of the revelation from uh, to Joseph about plural marriage. And Clayton is at the center of that. And so today we're talking about context. And we're gonna ask the question is, Clayton's journal contemporaneous, and secondarily, is Clayton credible? So as I we just dive have in, to compliment you on all of your alliteration. I'm very much enjoying it. This is very well done for Clayton. Okay. Well, uh, Elder Maxwell would be proud. He would be proud. <laughs> so <laughs> one of my favorites. Um, as we talk about the journal, we're going to we're going to talk about what is publicly available. And also, we're going to examine what has not been publicly available. But when we refer to the journal that has heretofore been referenced, most famously, it's in this book that you see on your screen, An Intimate Chronicle, that was compiled by uh, George D. Smith back in the mid-90s, I believe, 1995, I think. And as I said, we're going to dive into the context of this so we can understand it better. The importance of this record to the Joseph Smith polygamy narrative cannot be overstated. His journal is the singular piece, the only piece of alleged contemporaneous, what could actually be called evidence, if it's credible. Without his Nauvoo journal, all we have are uncorroborated accusations, decades old hearsay, wild speculation, loose correlation without causation. That's all that there is. I've, I heard Don Bradley, uh, Mormon historians say that there are 30 pieces of contemporaneous evidence. I, I, I beg to differ. Those are not evidences what he will claim, things like the happiness letter or things like the Sarah Ann Whitney letter or things like the, the affidavits in the expositor. Okay, Those things are not evidence. Yeah. Those things and I'm are... actually, I want to say I'm actually excited to talk to Donna Brett about that because he's going to come on and talk to me about oh, that. Oh, so fantastic. Be to be able to hear... Um, you know, to be able to discuss that a little further. So yeah, we'll be able to dig in, hopefully. I uh, agree with you. By the way, I have, from everything I've seen of Don Bradley, he seems to be 
really a wonderful guy and probably one of the best thinkers on this subject that I've encountered on the other side. The most fair-minded, um, especially as I just heard him blow up the whole Louisa Beeman narrative. Maybe we need to talk about that sometime. But yeah. um, the historians, the commentators, uh, they have not examined the things we're going to talk about today. I have not heard a single person address what we're going to address today. But rather, they have made unfounded claims about the contemporaneous nature of the journal. They trust them implicitly. They, they speak of these journals as though they are, it is a foregone conclusion that they are contemporaneous. And we will show today that the journal cannot be said to be contemporaneous with any certainty. And the strongest likelihood is that they, because there are three of them, there are three, if you want to call them volumes, they were written after the events and thus the credibility of the journals, they must come into question. Also, given what Clayton reveals him, uh, about himself in these journals, the major inconsistencies, um, the constant accusations against him, uh, serious character flaws that are revealed in the journals. Uh, be, by the way, being an outsider, an outsider to the inner circle of uh, Mormon hierarchy. It's always assumed that he's an insider. He's actually not. And we're going to discover a portion of that today. Um, yeah, an I, he's. He's the OG Mormon wannabe, right? He really is like William the wannabe Clayton is kind of how I refer to him in my mind because that's an important part to understand about him. But. And I and I and other than James Allen, who only lets it kind of briefly leak out, I've never heard anyone address this part of his character. And I don't know why exactly. I suspect it's because there's a need to have him be part of the team. Okay. Um, Incredible. Yep. He he's a very interesting character and and he's he he's kind of a loner. He's kind of on his own. Um and given all this, given all of these things, we should seriously question the veracity of his story. And without his story, and knowing what we know about Brigham and Heber, believing in and practicing spiritual wifery in England. I know that by the way, there's people out there who are Maybe you're hearing this for the first time. You're saying it wasn't called spiritual wifery. It was called spiritual wifery. We have many I testimonies. I have six quotes of Brigham Young himself calling it spiritual wifery that I've compiled. So it doesn't that, work. So, yeah. so those of you like Brian Hales who say there was a difference between spiritual wifery and plurality of wives or celestial plural marriage or polygamy, according to their own statements, according to Helen Mark Kimball, according to Emily Partridge, according to Brigham Young himself, it was called spiritual wifery in those days. So when I say they were practicing spiritual wifery in England, that's what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And they were doing this while, when they met William and baptized him in England. Because of these things, we must re-examine and question all of the accusations and decades old hearsay. And finally, we need to exonerate Joseph. So uh, first, I think it's really helpful to ask ourselves, what would be admissible in a court of law? And perhaps that can better help us understand these journals. Uh, I asked Jeremy, a lawyer friend. Really quickly, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just really re want to quickly respond to what you said about we need to exonerate Joseph, because I think that a common misunderstanding is that people think that we are acting under motivated reasoning, mm. that we have the foregone conclusion that Joseph was innocent and that we because of that are looking for the information. And I just wanted to clarify, because I know that this is the case with both you and me, that it's the opposite. We saw this and said, the evidence strongly supports the conclusion that we've got the wrong guy. And when you come to that conclusion, then you want to exonerate the right guy and make sure that we have the right guy accused. So I just wanted to clarify that because I want to head off any of those accusations and misunderstandings. I think if people will look at this information fairly, as you and I have done, they will very likely come up with the same conclusions we have. And when you see that, you want to exonerate the guy that's been falsely accused. So I think that's an incredibly important point. Th if you ha if this is the first time you're hearing me speak or he hearing Michelle speak, I I'll say again, I used to believe that he was. I yeah, used to teach people that he was. I used to think it was a celestial principle. It was only until I examined things closely that my my belief in this and and my um, my understanding of Joseph himself changed entirely. 
it's in read it's in studying him it's in reading his words it's in reading the revelations it's in understanding um his interactions between people they're not consistent with the tale that's told of him later they're certainly not consistent with brigham young and so when as i've come to know joseph smith it it has nothing to do with uh, i need him to yeah. not be a polygamist i I guess I could have needed him to be a polygamist before in order to maintain my current paradigm. Right. Um, it was, it, it is much more, it's, it's much more difficult to go against consensus, to go against power structures, to go against the, the high and mighty and the noble uh, academics and historians and commentators who, who garner so much attention. Look, we're a little fringe movement out here, um, growing, but a fringe movement. Growing, growing rapidly, yeah. <laughs> growing pretty rapidly. Um, but we certainly don't have, there's not a lot of uh, of notoriety and fame and fortune in this for us. Right. And so the only thing I care about, and you can judge this statement on its, on its merits, um, I care about what's true. And so far yeah. what I have found, I'm open to him being a polygamist if you'll show me some evidence. So far what I found is the opposite. And so- when we're talking about evidence, uh, I asked a lawyer friend of mine, hey, could you help me explain the rules of evidence? What's admissible in a court of law? Um, and he sent me over the code. And basically, a journal would be admissible in a court of law if um, it was made at or near the time uh, of the event and someone by someone who had knowledge of the event. Um, if it was conducted in a regular course of activity, and a journal would be that, if it's actually done as a daily record, and also if the opponent does not show that the source of information or the method of circumstance of preparation indicate a lack of trustworthiness. Okay, so we have to find the person who prepares it credible, and we also have to find that the, the, the mode of creating it was credible. I think, Michelle, you and I talked about how sometimes in divorce court, you know, journals are fabricated in order for one spouse to implicate the other in things they didn't do. And so yeah. uh, admitting a journal in a court of law, it's pretty tricky. Um, and so and part of that last piece is also the motivation. If like like so you're hitting I mean, I mean. Is there like I, I did use the example of a, an, an unhappy spouse starting to create a journal just to use as evidence. And it's somewhat clear when that happens. Right. So what I find interesting is that all through all of those points that you um, brought up about the credibility of a journal, all four of them are in serious problem with Clayton. I'm assuming you're going to go into it, but it's kind of fun to get to see. That Absolutely. Exactly. Check, check. Check, check, inadmissible, throw it out. Okay. So it, just to clarify, ChatGPT helps us to understand just a little bit more. The party offering the journal um, also needs to prove that it's genuine. The, the burden of proof really is on them to say this is a genuine record. The church has not released these journals. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit more. So, uh, general, Generally, journals are considered hearsay. And so oftentimes they're not even admissible, but but if they're extremely relevant to the subject matter um, and, and they are considered contemporaneous, if they can be established as contemporaneous, they, that hearsay rule can be overcome. And then the credibility of the journal itself and the person who created it can impact its weight as evidence. If the journal is inconsistent, contradicts other evidence, or seems manipulated, its credibility might be questioned. So just keep those in the back of your mind as we go through this. Historians, they don't use legal standards. I, I get that. You don't construct history based on legal standards in terms of considering evidence. There, it's, a, it's a different rule of thumb. However, when we're stating something definitively that we know happened, okay, um, then we might consider using a little bit higher standard for the things that we call evidence. Unfortunately, sometimes historians, they will speak with extraordinary certainty when the available evidence, it requires them, it demands them to speak with more humility and circumspection. Absolutely. Oh, can you go back to that slide and just let me do one little exercise? Yeah. 
Do you guys remember this from Sesame Street? One of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. And I want to know if you know what I'm referring to, because you have a panel of historians with the non-historian. The guy oh, that... who's an amateur historian who calls out every other amateur historian, right? That, and I just that's need true. to acknowledge that one of those things does not belong, which is it... the non-historian that is doing history and it... and using our non-historian status to come after us. The irony and hypocrisy of that is just so rich. So I couldn't let that slide past without prep. And, and that's that's Brian Hales, who's a, an is. anesthesiologist and by, you know, by occupation, I think he's retired. Um, that's not to minimize his work. His work has been extensive and, and in some ways extremely helpful to this entire discussion. Um, frankly, because it's pointed out, I think the weaknesses in the argument. Um, yes. Now, James I Allen. Continue. The primary biographer, the, 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 the principal biographer for William Clayton, um, he admits his own bias. And he says the following, which I really appreciate that he gives us a window into how he approached um, his work on William Clayton. No historian is totally free from bias. And at this point, I should recognize my own. As I studied Clayton's life, I saw success and failure, strength and weakness, inspiration and stumbling blocks. But out of all of it came a genuine respect for the man that had an obvious effect on what I've written. At the same time, I've tried not to forget the warning implied in a comment made by a friend who criticized an early draft of one chapter in which I rationalized with great empathy some of Clayton's problems. Quote, William's frailties make him lovable, my critic wrote, but not worshipable. I hope I have adjusted the manuscript so that what comes out is respect without idolatry, and a sympathetic presentation of important issues without historic, historical distortion. Interesting that he might even catch himself in somewhat idolizing William Clayton. Let me also wow. take the liberty of expressing a personal concern that in part arises from my being both a believing Latter-day Saint and a professional historian. The quest of the historian is not only for the facts, but also for a sense of balance as one attempts to recreate the past. In the process, at least two troublesome temptations must be avoided, both of which can affect historians of religion all too easily. One is to erase from history everything but that which is pleasing or non-controversial, and the other is to emphasize the sensational, the bizarre, and the negative because of their likely appeal to certain readers. Both tendencies tend to distort, and neither will ever provide the steady balance so essential to historical understanding. I have tried to do neither. Our heritage, to paraphrase Paul, is made up of many parts that, when fitly framed together, should provide us all with a better perspective on what the past was all about. Okay, so the 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 interesting thing is what he's what what is leaking out here is what I think affects every one of the historians as well as every one of the commentators when it comes to William Clayton. They love the things he's written because of the story it's able to help them tell. And okay. for whatever reason, this story is so important to them. They will not give the story up. They, they will hold, and you will notice this, if you're watching this, and just compare what we're going to talk about and the detail with which we will examine this, and ask yourself if anyone will give this kind of attention to this material. And my supposition is they won't, they'll ignore it. Um, or they'll just try to talk it away as a, as a strange conspiracy theory by really, really um, mentally deranged people. That's my guess. Can I, because oh, you go ahead and then I wanna share two things, but you, you finish your thought. They need this story by William Clayton to be true. And mm -hmm. for whatever reason, James Allen is able to overlook a lot um, to the point where he almost idolizes William Clayton is, and he's had to, in his revisions, um, uh, uh, edit his, his telling of the story to give it, quote, more balance. And so I think we ought to just look at what is the, what is the truth as far as we can ascertain it and, and let go of our, uh, of our need for something to support our argument. I know people accuse us of that, but, uh, you can judge for yourself whether the information we pro provide today is is straight shooting or not. So I want to just back up what you were saying with two specific examples that I have, because I know we talked about historians having a different standard, but I'm not c confident that it's a better standard because right. I just did that small piece on the William Law Diary 
I quoted a historian that basically said, I chose to utilize it heavily because William Law's voice is ben so Parks. important. Yep. And, and the fact that it was almost certainly a forgery, very likely a Mark Hoffman forgery, very possibly yep. a Mark Hoffman forgery doesn't matter as much as I want what it says for my story. And I was reported in another conversation where D. Michael Quinn, and you could double check this, admitted to knowingly use it, using a known Hoffman forgery in his book, The Origins, uh, whatever it's his origins book. And he did that. And when he was asked about it, he just said, because it sounded like what Joseph would say. And it's it. I, we, we need the voice of we need the sources of Joseph Smith. They basically want it so much that they lose the ability to, to question it. And that is a huge problem when they are given this this elevated platform of authority that I think they should need to earn better than they do. There are those out there. There are pr some prominent historians out there right now. I won't call them out, but they, they, they are so, I, I don't know what their, what their spiritual or religious sensibilities are. My sense is they're either agnostic or atheist and, and, and they're in their mind, it's just an impossibility that there could be anything divine. And so there has to be a fraudulent bent to the story. Mm -hmm. And so their perspective is everything is fraudulent. Everything Joseph Smith does is uh, has to be explained by some kind of story of a con man. It, every part of it can be explained by by a man who's either mentally deranged. He's got some kind of personality. Uh, some He's on the um, the the uh, narcissistic personality disorder scale or um, or he's got some mental illness or something of that nature. Plus, he's also nefarious and he's and he's always doing things that are self-serving. Look, in, in this work, part of this won't be examined today, but part of what is absolutely important to examine are are the things he says and does that he says and does not what other people said that he said and did. You can find a mountain of stuff that people said while he was alive in the exposés that were written that are just pure hogwash. That, that find no basis right. in reality. And mm -hmm. and when you, and by the way, many of these historians will find credibility in those statements without anchoring them to something real, something that they and can the actually find in the record. Is, many of those statements are by folks like Joseph Jackson or John Bennett. Precisely. John, who, who even in their own day were known, of, you know, like, like, as the worst of scoundrels. The newspapers, right. The newspapers started out saying this eminent, wonderful, laudable person just because they were going after Joseph Smith. And within just a little while, they have to say, OK, we know this guy has problems, but here's what he's saying. And yet our own historians, LDS historians, even not even just the skeptics, use those people as unquestioned authorities and automatically accept everything they say. So everything Joseph Smith said was a lie even from LDS historians and everything these despicable figures said, who were known as despicable figures universally in their own day, everything they said is true. I cannot make sense of that for the life of me. They, they, John Hayacek made a comment once, he's a document expert. He, um, he made a comment that the, 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 he called them the new Mormon historians give equal yep. weight to all evidence. That's actually not quite true. It's not they, true. they give, they give weight to whatever evidence they want to give weight to. And, and they don't actually assess the evidence based on its actual, um, uh, veracity based mm -hmm. on, based on whether it ought to be considered credible or not. They, they, they simply there's a statement over here by Martin Harris, therefore it must be true, because I want it to be true, because it rings true, as Michael Quinn said, you know, God rest mm -hmm. his soul. And so yeah. um, I think we ought to have a different standard than what is being practiced ubiquitously by the, especially the Mormon historians. I, I have a real issue with the Mormon historians because I, frankly, I call it uh, his, historical malpractice. Because- yes. They they will never do what we are doing here, and and I challenge and that's all of why, that's why what we are doing is so important. If no one is there to keep them honest, they don't have to be honest. So even those who disagree with us or think we're ridiculous, at least acknowledge that we are doing a great work to force historians to be more honest. Eventually, the, they're going to have to grapple with these things. There's a new biography coming out by uh, Richard Turley, church historian. And uh, going to be the definitive biography on Joseph Smith. And undoubtedly, it will repeat the same nonsense that's in the book Saints and that's in the Joseph Smith papers. Which amounts yeah. to gaslighting, honestly. For those uh, of us who have done the work and studied it, I always feel gaslit when they 
are so dishonest, you know, when, anyway. when they tell the story and they talk about it, those of you watching, ask yourself, when do they say the following? Brigham Young in 1867 said that Joseph in 1843 did. When did they say that Emily Partridge in 1892 said under oath in a court case, such and such, and it contradicted with what she said in 1877 and also what she wrote in 1884. When do they do that? When do they give you right. the full context of what they're quoting? What they don't do is that, that what they say is Joseph Smith in 1842 did such and such, or in 1841, he was sealed to Louisa Beeman. They don't tell you where they get the information. And what right. it leaves is an extraordinarily misleading impression that it was a, that, that it, that it's accepted that that just happened. And as we just made reference to Don Bradley has overthrown the notion that Louisa Beeman was the first quote, plural wife. What else can be overthrown if you actually examine what's going on? Well, we're going to start that with William Clayton. So let's get okay. back to that yeah. narrative. So yeah. now we only have scant excerpts from what are the Clayton journals um, from one historian's notes, that historian being Andy Ehat. The historians have unquestionably trusted these experts, these excerpts, um, and they have uh, they just make wild assumptions about the credibility of the journals. Now, as I've mentioned, the actual journals themselves have not ever been released to the public, which is odd. In a legal sense, if, if you were to claim in a court of law, I have evidence of something happening, a crime being committed or, or something occurring, um, and you don't produce that evidence, but you make a statement about it, you simply claim the evidence exists, but then you fail to produce it, that creates something called adverse inference. It's a legal term that basically says this, an adverse inference is generally, um, is a legal inference adverse to the concerned party made from a party's silence or the absence of requested evidence. For example, as a sanction of spoliation of evidence, a court may instruct the jury, it could draw an inference that the evidence contained in the destroyed documents or the unproduced documents would have been unfavorable. Let me translate. If you don't produce the evidence, the judge can say to the jury, you can basically infer the opposite of what they're saying or that it works against them, that their argument works against them because they refuse to produce said evidence. So it's a strict warning against calling something evidence without being able to back it up. Now, and why is it this to its most basic level? It's basically the dog ate my homework. <laughs> that's exactly. basically exactly what it amounts to right i have no i promise i promise i did it all but the dog ate it that's exactly what we have happening here so i just wanted to really make that simple every this is obvious it's like just logically basic for everyone to understand this so why is it taking so long we have no idea that the church said in 2017 that they would release the journals um just recently, they said they're, they're, it's still years away, but they're still working on it. I don't know. We can only speculate. Um, so now all we can do is examine what we have available to us. Now let's take a closer look at the clever clerk and his work of creating these, the context of these journals. So Allen says this in 1842, William Clayton this is James Allen in his biography, becoming involved in nearly every important activity in Nauvoo, including the private concerns of the prophet. As a scribe, he kept the sacred book of the law of the Lord, was officially designated to write the history of the Nauvoo temple, helped prepare, prepare the official history of Joseph Smith, indeed his personal journals, became the source for many entries in that history, and kept various other books and accounts as a sign. He was a member of the temple committee and kept all the financial and other records dealing with the building of the temple including the collection and recording of tithes. Later, after the baptismal font was completed, it was up to Clayton to issue receipts certifying that a person was entitled to the pri privileges of the font for baptisms for the dead because he had paid, because he, the person, had paid tithing. He became Nauvoo City Treasurer, Recorder, and Clerk of the Nauvoo City Council, Secretary Pro Tem of the Nauvoo Masonic Lodge, an officer in the Nauvoo Mu Music Association, and a member of the committee responsible for erecting the Music Hall in Nauvoo. He also became a member and clerk of the highly important Council of 50, as well as a member of Joseph Smith's private prayer circle. So he went from text, uh, textile clerk to the clerk of the kingdom. 
in a pretty short period of time. His work began on the 10th of February, 1842. In his Manchester journal, he writes, Brother Kimball came in the morning to say that I must go to Joseph Smith's office and assist Brother Richards. I accordingly got, re accordingly got ready and went to the office and commenced entering tithing for the temple. I was still shaking with ague every day. I hope I pronounced that right, ague every day, but I did it. I did not much. It did not much disable me for work. Can I, can I back up and ask a question about your yes, last please. slide where you kind of showed the, the the one right before that, the preeminent rise of William Clayton? Is that like, have you sourced that? Is that all based on William Clayton's own journals? His, like, was he a member of Joseph's <coughs> prayer circle or is that? So, William yes. In, that? Well, OK, that's a. Uh, I, I've, I've been discussing with Whitney Horning, frankly, um, the references in the Wilford Woodruff journal whether or not that's actually a contemporaneous record or not. I know people will freak out about saying that, but I think there's some evidence that it, that also might be a reminiscence rather than a, than a, than a day-to-day -day record. Um, there is reference in Clayton's journal where he's finally accepted to what some call the quorum. Okay. What, what, um, what is mentioned as the quorum in, in Richard's uh, recording. I call it Richard's memo book, but the historians call it Joseph's journal. It's not really a journal. It's a memo book. It's a right. draft. Okay. But in Richard's memo book, um, he, he calls it the quorum, the, the group, which included, by the way, William Law and uh, William Marks and others. Um, they met in the red brick store. They met for prayer meetings with Joseph Smith. He gave instruction. This is where he gave something of some kind of ceremony that we don't have any record of other than what people tell about it. Um, and Willard Richards documents some of this, actually a good deal of it in his journal. Um, in those references we have, and in Clayton's journal, he mentions when he was accepted to that, quote, quorum. And by the way, it was late. It was in the beginning okay. of 1844. You would think that this kid would be would have been swept up and taken under Joseph's wing right when he got off the boat or shortly after beginning to work in the temple office, but he didn't. It took quite a bit of time. And I think we're going to see why as we get to know him a little bit better. Okay. That's that's why my, I'm asking, because I'm comparing, for example, James Whitehead's version of who William Clayton was and how yes. in the inner circles he was versus William Clayton's claims of being all alone with Joseph and Hiram for the most important yes. revelation, because the yes. three of them were best buds that hung out with nobody else. That that's what I'm that's what I'm wanting to us, us yes. to sort um, through. In the next episode, we'll actually we're, we're going to read James Whitehead extensively. And what he okay. says about William Clayton, so we can get a, a, a sense of another narrative and see if, see how that fits. But okay. yes, the all of these things you see that Alan mentions are absolutely documented. He 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 was extraordinarily active in the um, in, in recording parts of of Mormondom, uh, whether it as a clerk um, or or as a uh, well, always as a clerk, but recording minutes of meetings. Um, making transcripts of uh, of sermons Joseph gave, recording tithing receipts, doing land transactions, creating deeds. Um, that was his that was his occupation. He was a trained clerk okay. from from Manchester, England. He worked in a textile factory um, back in the uh, 18 late 1830s, I believe, um, and and then quit his job and and became the second counselor in the mission presidency. Um, after he was baptized, they they would rise people to the ranks of leadership uh, in some cases very quickly, um, mm -hmm. and 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 he went from there. And he worked extensively with Heber Kimball and Willard Richards whilst in England, which is why he was asked to do these things um, in um, in Nauvoo because they Nauvoo. had experience with him. And Heber um, had the ear of Joseph Smith. Okay. So, so as far as being in Joseph's prayer circle, that's valid too from other sources, um, or is that just from Clayton? So and, the the source that I have says that the twelve voted to admit him. Okay. okay. Now, so what I can't what I can't tell is whether or not uh, Joseph Smith was involved in that decision or not. I don't know, um, and I okay. think there's a lot of things that are assumed by. Wow the term quorum because they overlay the narrative of polygamy on top of the, yeah. the red brick store meetings and they make them all one thing. And they, and they, it doesn't quite work that way. There's, there's a lot of anomalies, a lot of things to, to pull apart about whatever was going on in the red brick store. 
a lot of things to understand about that, that that aren't as simple as this is where it all began. It began in the secret meetings above the red brick store where Joseph began to roll out the endowment. And some of them he he inculcated into the practice of plural marriage. That is um, uh, it's not that straightforward at all. And so and, and okay. we only have sparse evidence, only very sparse evidence of what Joseph was doing there. OK, so, yeah, so I'll let you continue. I just wanted the, the, the reason I think this is an important question is because, according to Clayton, in his journal, Joseph is always just giving him an earful about Emma. And he's always like, like William Clayton knows everything that happens in Joseph's we, private life because he's the number one guy, which, interestingly, William Law then later does the same thing. Emma always mm -hmm. would complain to me about Joseph. Yep. It's always. And well, so I want to want to know that how story. That, that story means. starts with John Bennett. Okay. That story starts with John Bennett and Chauncey Higby. One of the one of the things that they would say to the women, this is for those of you who are not familiar with John Bennett, he was the first big scandalous person in Nauvoo in 1841, 1842. Joseph was dealing with, with him for about a year and a half, trying to figure out how to how to deal with this guy. Finally, um, they disfellowship him. I don't know if he's ever formally excommunicated, but he's out. Um, uh, he he's he's kicked out of the Nauvoo Mason, uh, the the Masonic Lodge, kicked out as mayor, yeah, and, and, the, and the and the and the first, first presidency, presidency and, and big, responsible for getting the city charter. And so, big scandal, and it and it causes yeah. Joseph to go public and to teach the Relief Society and to publish things in the Times and Seasons. It's a big big deal. Well, in the in the trials and the 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 Nauvoo uh, High Council Stake High Council trials. Um, the women who testify against Chauncey Higby and John Bennett, one of the things they mentioned was they would say, why, why does Joseph, why does he speak against this stuff? Why, why does he keep it so private? Why doesn't he talk about this? Because they would say, Joseph told us we could do this. Joseph said we could yeah, go around and have free intercourse saying. with you if you don't tell anybody. And some of them would say, and I'm going to marry you. I'm going to, you know, I promise to take care of you. Why doesn't Joseph do this? Well, because it will cause him trouble in his own household. They would say the women oh, would say, would and so, say that. Okay. so that story um, was part of that narrative. Now I don't know if Brigham Young and Heber Kimball got it from them, but that was there at least. Okay, so mm -hmm. it, we're going to discover a portion of what, what I believe, um, a piece to this puzzle as to why William is writing these things. We're going to discover a piece of that today. In the next episode, we'll actually read the stuff that he writes about Joseph and Emma. For those of you who think we're going to skip over the scandalous stuff, we're not. We're going to actually get into it. We'll show you. Um, you can read it yourself, by the way. Just go Google it. It's out there, but we'll show you. We'll talk about it. But I'll link it below. Yeah. One of the things that's really, really important is to understand Clayton's work is what I call a copyist. He began working with Heber Kimball in the 18, uh, 1840, 43, 45, 47, uh, doing copy work for Kimball. He was involved in copying the Nabu Mason minute books. He had a pattern of embellishing and leaving blank pages, pages for future editing. Um, he collaborated extensively with Willard Richards, which we'll talk about. He was involved in copying the Council of 50 Minutes. And then we're going to talk about the infamous Nabu Journal, the reason we're all here today. In terms of his work with Heber Kimball and why this is relevant, um, there are many instances in his journal where he talks about working with, with Kimball in 1840. During this time, I preached occasionally on the Sabbath. The first three or four days after I came home, I spent writing Brother Kimball's history, which was lengthy. 23rd April, 1843. Um, Allen, James Allen writes, Clayton also at times assisted other church leaders with their writing and helped Heber C. Kimball arrange his history. So he continued to do that into Nauvoo. Um, in the Nauvoo Temple history, uh, Clayton was invited to assist Heber C. Kimball in keeping a record of the Nauvoo Temple. Uh, 18, 8, April 1847, this morning, this is um, Clayton writing in his Pioneer Journal. This morning, I wrote a letter for Heber to his wife, Valate. I commenced writing Heber's journal and wrote considerable. He wants me to write his journal all the journey. I also wrote considerable in this book, meaning his own journal. 21st of April, 1847. Elder Kimball proposed tonight that I should leave a number of pages for so much of his journal as I'm behind in copying and start from the present and keep it up daily. He furnished me a candle and I wrote this uh, the journal of this day's travel by candlelight in his journal, leaving 56 pages blank. Interesting question. Why in the world would Heber need to, quote, rewrite his journal? OK, now this is to prepare his history. This is. It has a purpose, but it's interesting that he would turn over his journal to William Clayton to have him rewrite it, leave pages blank so they could go back in and edit things. But that was a pattern established in his work 
with Heber Kimball. He was also involved in copying the Nauvoo Mason minute books. Uh, interestingly enough, he took over for John Bennett. John Bennett was the clerk for the Masonic Lodge in Nauvoo. Um, and Br Brady Winslow um, has an interesting um, dial. I think it's a dialogue article, Irregularities in the Work of the Nauvoo Lodge, where he helps us ex understand a pattern that Clayton engaged in. He says this, when Clayton transferred the contents of Minute Book One, that was recorded by John Bennett, okay? So he took the contents of Minute Book One um, into Minute Book Two. He resolved the issue by reserving several blank pages. So here we go again. We're leaving blank pages for signatures before continuing his copy work. Why? So they could go back in and add stuff later. When copying minutes from Minute Book 1 into Minute Book 2, Clayton also made other changes to the record that cleaned up the manuscript. In a few instances where Bennett deleted text in Minute Book 1, whether because of mistakes or conscious revisions, Clayton omitted those deletions from Minute Book 2. Okay, so I'm going to skip over this, but you get the idea. He's starting to change small elements of the record. Uh, Winslow says, as a scribe... Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just, I'm just seeing... So, so far we're seeing this pattern of leaving blank pages to mm -hmm. be able to rewrite things and i want to make sure i'm catching what you're you know what you're he would copy things changing, over from minute book would... one and then he would okay, embellish and fill in gaps or create narrative or edit things into minute book two he didn't do a straight copy and we uh, winslow says the following as scribe for nauvoo lodge clayton felt authorized to make slight changes to the lodge lodge's records as he saw it this is evident in the way that he rephrased some of the things Bennett wrote in Minute Book One. While some of those modifications okay. reflect a desire for minute entries to follow the same formulaic pattern, others served to, served to add clarification. Skipping over, he says, though none of these changes significantly alter the meaning of the record, they nevertheless display the agency that Clayton felt he had as a scribe, okay? In transferring minutes from Minute Book One to Minute Book Two. I only bring this up to say he felt that he could just write things into the record that were not necessarily from the record to clarify or to give um, meaning that was helpful. Okay. Now Winslow in this record doesn't see anything that's, that's uh, problematic. And I assume there's not, however, this will play into what we're going to discover. Can I tell you what's coming through my mind right now? We believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. <laughs> I think it's like we talk about how things go through the hands of scribes and that's potentially problematic. So it's interesting to see that playing out right here with our own well, history. And yeah, especially in the Book of Mormon. Um, actually, is it, sorry, I'm going to get this wrong. The Doctrine and Covenants. The wicked one cometh and taketh away light and truth. By what? Mm -hmm. By disobedience and by the traditions of their fathers, which are not correct. How do we get our traditions wrong? By the scribes by the people who write down the history, who tell us this is what happened. And so this is really important to know how these people did this. Now, his collaboration with Richards is really important. Yes? I just I just have to say the connection between scribes and historians at this point in what you just described is pretty profound. The record we keepers are our critical. Traditions of our, yeah, and our record keepers, we don't have scribes nowadays. We have the historians that give us the narrative. In other words, the traditions of our fathers. I, I think that's pretty interesting to connect the potential. I, I think it's important to consider if that scripture can be connected to the narrative from historians instead of just the record of the scribes. We, ha we have to have an accurate view of our history, not, mm -hmm. a, not a, a propagandized view, not an mm -hmm. agenda-driven view. And we, we ought to be brave enough to face that. So let's take a look at Clayton and, and I, Richards. And I love how you say with humility, because I don't think what we need is a definitive, authoritative, this is what happened. No. I think it's so much better to say, we have this source, we have this source, we have this source. Let people have access to the complexity and use their own discernment. That is so much more honest than thinking that you have to put forward a finalized narrative that is not true. I have said this before. I'll say it again. Don't trust me. I know you don't. Yeah. By the way. I know. I know that people watching don't. That's a, a great. Don't trust me. Read the stuff yourself. Take a look at it yourself. You are smart enough to discern what is true. I I am done with experts, 
um, academics, historians who claim we must go through them to understand the truth. We can read the same documents that they can. And, and for the first time in history, actually, we have ac easy access to those same documents. And so they cannot be the gatekeepers anymore. And they're not. And right. you should not rely on them as the gatekeepers. Listen to them and take their opinion and see if it lines up with what you can read for yourself. One of those things is looking at Clayton and Richards and their work, the work that they did together. The JSP, the Joseph Smith Papers, in an appendix um, on how the Joseph Smith journals were created, they help us understand um, what Richards was doing and what Clayton was doing with Richards. They say the following. By the way, they, they catalog four um, notes, four, they call them draft notes, that were used in the creation of the journals. They say the four short documents in this appendix appear to be notes Willard Richards and William Clayton made of some of Joseph Smith's activities in January, March, April, and December 1842 and May 1844, respectively. Some of the information contained in these notes inscribed on loose sheets of paper is also featured in the Joseph Smith journal entries of the same dates. Though frequently in more detail and in, more in a more polished form, suggesting that the notes were inscribed first and that Richards later used the notes as source material for Joseph Smith's journal. By the way, let me pause there. If you look at Joseph Smith's journal, Joseph Smith's journal is sparse. It's a very strange record. So he's taking very loose notes and moving those over into what we call the Joseph Smith journal. If you look at the Joseph Smith journal, this thing is more of a draft. It's more of a draft for a history. It has very strange notation. He'll put, for example... Uh, on on a page, it'll be blank, and all it will say is cold and balmy or stormy today. Now, why in the world would you put the date at the top and the notation of the weather at the bottom if you were not using that as a as as color for a later telling of what happened on that day based on other things that you've gathered? Because you have all kinds of notes that you've been taking, as we can see on the screen here. You have notes that you're taking. When you're at an event, you're, you're at a sermon, you're writing your notes down in your, in, 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 on loose pieces of paper or in a notebook or whatever. We don't have most of that. You're taking those notes and you're putting them into another volume. And we know from, from Willard Richards' position, he was not Joseph's personal secretary. He's referred to that once, but he's really the historian. Okay. okay, That's Willard Richards' position. He's the historian. And so he is documenting the history. I think Joseph trusted him in the beginning. I don't think it was till the very end that Joseph did not trust him. And so he would follow Joseph around. Sometimes he's writing things he's not there for, but he's gathering information. He's putting them into this, into this memo book, into this draft. So this is referring to that effort. Does that make sense? Okay. That's super important. And it, I also do want to point out, even the, even the Joseph Smith historians ad, admit that this didn't get carried around. This was a big book. That well, this one you see on your screen. This the book of the law of the Lord for sure. That that is more of a polished um, record book that that contained uh, uh, re re some revelations, uh, letters, mm -hmm. um, daily activities of Joseph Smith. It's not a journal at all. It's more it's more of a history, really, um, that contains really important events and um, recordings uh, related to the restoration related to Joseph Smith. Um, yeah, so, but I'm referring to the Joseph Smith journal. I, we're really dishonest calling these diaries or journals because we, we use that word so freely. So loosely. And it gives a misimpression of what they really are. Because it gives an impression that Joseph Willard Smith Richards is, is the same thing. It, it gives the impression that Willard Richards is at his hip every day documenting right. everything he's doing. Writing and it's, as he that goes. Was, that was simply not the case. We know of many instances exactly. where, where he's not there and writing on things he's not there for. He's gathering information from other places. So the, these notes that you see on your screen are therefore critical to understand the process by which Richards created Joseph Smith's Nauvoo journals. And also they help us understand Clayton's process as well. The documents reproduced here are the only extant notes of Joseph Smith's, uh, about Joseph Smith kept by Richards, though they are likely only a small sample of such texts Richards recorded in his effort to keep Joseph, Joseph's journal. Joseph's Nauvoo era journals were kept in two records. The first was kept by Willard Richards, William Clayton, Eliza Snow, and Erastus Derby. That's what you see on your screen, the Book of the Law of the Lord, okay, who recorded entries uh, from December 1841 to December 1842 in that book. 
Now, beginning 21st December 1842 and continuing to the final week of the prophet's life, Richards inscribed entries in four small volumes designated as President Joseph Smith's journal. Now, the reason they call it that is because Richards called it that. OK, so he called it President Joseph's journal, so they feel like they can get away with calling it. I just wish they would be honest about really characterizing what these are. Entries in the former record are clean and relatively free from cancellations. Yeah, I wouldn't call them clean, um, but because they're, they're, it's relatively very... is a helpful word there. They can say yes. relatively clean. Everyone can decide what that means. <laughs> and other scribal evidence that traditionally indicate point of first inscription. Many of the entries were clearly written retrospectively, also suggesting that the journal text with, within the Book of the Law of the Lord was copied from some other source. The book's large size um, would have rendered it inconvenient for Joseph Smith's scribes to carry around, and its concurrent use as a ledger for recording donations for construction of the temple meant that it was kept in the counting room on the lower floor of Joseph Smith's brick store. Unlike, unlike the massive book of the Law of the Lord, the subsequent Joseph Smith journal, President Joseph Smith's journal, was kept in small, pocket-sized memorandum books that Richards could easily have carried with him. Textual evidence such as space left to add detail later and incomplete words from hurried note-taking indicate that many of the entries in this se second Nauvoo journal were inscribed contemporaneously. Other entries appear to have been written days after the events they describe and were likely based on draft notes like those reproduced here. Three of the four notes describe events recorded in entries during the periods for which Richards was the scribe of Joseph's journals. Okay, so we get the point. <clears throat> he's got these four little memo books, okay, that he's carrying around and he's and he's writing things sometimes on the day, we can't really tell, sometimes on the day, sometimes retrospectively, but he's leaving blank spaces. It's not a traditional journal. It's a draft. It's a memo book to create a history later. But he's also using other loose pieces of paper or other sources to copy from, to copy in there. You'll notice he oftentimes will record sermons Joseph has given. He's not recording that sermon on the day in that book He's because it's too clean for that. And we'll see that, by the way. We'll see what, real, what Willard Richards' writing looks like when he's writing in a hurry. Okay. Oh, okay. And as we mentioned, there are hundreds and hundreds. It's not just a few. It's hundreds. Uh, somebody counted. I haven't counted myself, so I'm going to take this at their word. But over 600 blank spaces and pages. Okay. This is just, it's, and all you have to do is go onto the Joseph Smith papers and go through the journals and flip page after page after page. It's unreal how much space is left in here. That's why it's not a journal. It's a draft. And he used it for other purposes. You don't so see this. I, I just want to check with you. My assumption is that that was for future. The purpose of that was for future editions. Right. And, being, and I don't say that that's nefarious, by the way, especially in the beginning, because Richards was the historian. I think he was keeping notes, at least in the beginning. Now, by the way, it's possible he didn't write those at all on the day. It's very possible that he recorded those after Joseph's death. We can't tell. Because you simply to, don't know. We need to pause here. Just specify, clarify for anyone who's not keeping up with this. Willard Richards was a polygamist in Nauvoo. He was also on oh, absolutely. Team. So if anyone's wondering, that's what we're talking about. This because William, William Clayton was a polygamist in Nauvoo. Willard Richards was a polygamist in Nauvoo. So I know people are like, "Oh, we're conspiracy theorists." The fact is, no matter which side of this you're on, you're a conspiracy theorist. Whether you believe Joseph and his inner circle were lying, that's a conspiracy right? Or whether you believe many people were lying without Joseph's and William Marks and several other people's knowledge, it's actually a small, a smaller conspiracy to understand that it was these people. That, that's what we're talking about. And Willard Richards is absolutely in on it, as is William Clayton. And, and, the, and many of those people lied at the time when they were actually actively practicing plural marriage, right. or they knew about it being practiced. Um, and they they decried it publicly, um, but we're doing the opposite. What you see right. on your and screen I think right the now. It's important to acknowledge that. I'm sorry, but but it's like people act like our stance is so ridiculous that we're saying these people were lying about it publicly while doing it privately. They're saying exactly the same thing about not only these people but Joseph Smith. The only difference is 
who was involved in this known conspiracy. And it's not only Joseph and Hiram that weren't. There were many, many that weren't and a smaller number that were. So I want to just clarify that ours makes more sense. It's a smaller conspiracy and a conspiracy that is provable and that has a hard evidence behind it. And theirs isn't. So anyway, just I needed to throw that in there. But you go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's okay. What you see on your screen are are the actual journals. Uh, there were scribes that kept journals for Joseph. Um, uh, Oliver Cowdery kept part of his journals. Warren Parrish kept part of his journals. You don't see in these, quote, journals what you see with Willard Richards. I point this out because these are oh. actual day-to-day -day records. These are these are guys writing stuff on the days. There's no spaces. There's, they're just, they're messy. Um, they're contemporaneous and, and their recordings, they might have been recorded, you know, days after, but regardless, they're, they're recorded like an actual journal, entry to entry to entry to entry, um, somewhat sloppy handwriting, recording contemporaneous events that Joseph is having them, he's dictating to them and or they're, they, they are they are making mention of aspects of his life. So they're not um, premeditating future changes and alterations correct. for, okay, that's good correct. to whether know. Whether it's that's a, that's Warren Parrish or whether it's George Robinson or James Mulholland, the, the, the previous journals to, to Richards are all the same in terms of this type of recording. They change wow. with Richards. So the book of the law of the Lord, which is considered one of the, it's in the journal section. That's not really a journal. It's more of a, a, a of a history or a polished record. The Richards Joseph Smith journals are better described as memo books or drafts or draft notes to create Joseph's history. I really would, I, I'm not going to let the historians get away with this. Let's start being accurate about how we identify documents. I don't care what Richards called it. Let's at least be accurate about what these are. Now, why is this so important? Because of the pattern, you create contemporaneous notes and copy them later into another volume. Clayton participated with Richards in this effort at that time. Now, Clayton, as we've shown and we'll see, followed this process in his own records creation. He would record contemporaneous notes, copy them into another record. He would leave blank spaces and pages when creating the new draft. And then he creates what we call, and we'll examine this, a clean or fair copy. Now, it should be noted that nothing, absolutely nothing, in the Joseph Smith journals implicates, in the, well, calling them the journals, in the memo books, uh, implicates Joseph with polygamous activity or sympathy, just the opposite. The only references to polygamy, that by the way, this is what, one of the reasons why I give them some credibility, because I think Richards is recording them somewhere around the time, okay? I think he's purposefully leaving spaces because he knows later I'm gonna write the history. I just, I'm making notes. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna compile all this stuff together. This is my main draft book that I'm creating, right? I'm leaving, but I gotta write the history later. So this, this is my working material. Okay. He would not, I don't believe, later on have written some of the things that he recorded in Joseph's in, in this journal quote uh, that that where Joseph says, "Try everyone who's practicing uh, spiritual wifery." Okay, uh, uh, polygamy is. Uh, I forbid it. Okay, and we're going to examine that here as well. Can I even add one other one other thing? Um, one thing I found interesting is so Joseph Smith preached all day on July sixteenth. And that's where in the afternoon he preached about eternal marriage. Yes. And it's interesting, eternal monogamous marriage. He didn't even, you know, have to point out monogamy because he didn't know that polygamy was this thing <laughs> right. that was happening under his nose. But William Clayton, I know um, Willard Richards, interestingly, he wasn't there and he reports on his morning speeches and says nothing about the afternoon speech on eternal mm. marriage, but leaves a page and a half blank. So that's a prime example right there of where it's already being somewhat altered because it's strange that he doesn't there it, you, you learn as much about what they don't include as you do about what they do include that's an incredibly important point over time there's all kinds of things whether it's elizabeth ann whitney or whether it's missing newspaper articles or whether it's things that that william clayton for example does not record on a specific day like hiram's uh, eight, hiram's april 1884 eight. speech william clayton does not record april it late. at all um, right. He gives vague reference to it in his journal, but he records it on the wrong day, which is interesting. And so, okay. Um, the only references, by the way, in the Richards journal uh, or the the Richards memo book, um, show that Joseph was decidedly categorically against it. 
and this will be examined a little more later. So let's okay, examine. So, so I have a question. So the so just repeat that last part is what is categorically against it. That's the Richards memo in, book. In, in the Richards words, memo book. Yes, in the Richards memo books, there's no instances of Joseph being connected to plural marriage. The only instances re relating to plural marriage or spiritual wifery are Joseph being against it or preaching or speaking against it. The only instances. One thing, one thing I think is interesting there is that from what you just read, this memo book was kept most likely in the Red Book store where Joseph Smith and the other scribes and other people could read it and have Very, access to possibly, it. Possibly, possibly. These are that, small. These are these are okay. like these are small. They're about they're about five by uh oh, so this is seven the, okay. inches. They're the they're the little books that you see on top yep. of the book of the law okay. of the Lord. That's that those are the actual books themselves. And so he All could right. he could carry them around in his bag. I think the I think these were these were he was keeping memos. He was just keeping track of stuff. Yeah. And this was for a later usage. And he was also recording other things on other pieces of paper and somehow bringing some of those in there. So it's it's not entirely clear when he was recording these. The The point of this is to draw the line between Richards and Clayton and their work, their their joint work, frankly, as scribes. Um, who would later also work together on Joseph's history. So now let's examine all of the same pattern. Okay. Clayton's work with the Council of 50 record. This we're going to go a little more detail because this is critical to understanding the Nauvoo journals. He was a clerk for the Council of 50 starting in early 1844 when the council was created. He was the main clerk, really, that kept the rough contempor contemporaneous minutes. There were other clerks as well, but he did the bulk of it. Joseph asked him and all the other clerks to destroy the minutes. There's a reason for that, because the, the mob, he, Joseph was afraid the mob was coming. There were some things that Joseph talked about where, and I believe he was ordained a king, okay? This is a spiritual I'll at king. I'll some point get into the Council of Fifty. Well, I'll, I'll address that in the podcast. In some the later point of that is Joseph. Uh, the yeah. the papers make it clear that, that that Joseph's concerned that that the the minutes could be used against him. So he asked people just to, to destroy the minutes, and other leaders like Brigham Young would ask the minutes to be destroyed as well after Joseph dies. Well, Clayton kept them, and he used them to create a clean or fair copy after Joseph's death without anyone's knowledge. Clayton held on to these records for over two years, and then he finally handed, handed them over to Brigham Young in 1847. So let's read from the JSP to understand a little bit about these. This is so important because this will help us to understand what he's doing with, the, with his Nauvoo journal. The Nauvoo era minutes of the Council of 50 were recorded in three small blank books kept by council clerk William Clayton. His journal entry for 5 October 1845 notes that he spent the day recording minutes of the Council of 50 and that he recorded 43 pages of a small record like this, indicating that the blank book he was using for the council record was small like his own journal. In fact, it's exactly like his own journal. Now, just put that in the back of your mind, okay? The volumes of the Council of 50 are almost identical with minute millimeter difference, but they're basically the same type of record book. Oddly enough, they actually happen to be the exact same size as the Richards memo books, which is interesting. I don't know if we can draw an inference from that or not, but they're the same ty exact type of volume. Okay. Which is interesting because his England journal is very different. Brigham Young's journal is different. All these other journals are very different, but for whatever reason, the council of 50, the Nabu journal and the Richards memo books are all basically the same. So, <clears throat> indicating the blank book he was using for the council record was small like his own journal. Clayton's journal for that period is very close in size and shape to the volumes in which he recorded the council of 50 minutes. Both Richards and Clayton had considerable clerical, clerical experience. Richards served as the regular clerk of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles since at least 1841, keeping minutes of meetings and writing correspondence on behalf of the Quorum. Okay, jumping ahead. Either then might have served well as record keeper, but the records presented in this volume were almost all created originally by Clayton and were all inscribed by him into the permanent record. The survival of original rough copies and later fair copies of Clayton's minutes for early Utah meetings may provide a window into how Clayton produced the Nauvoo era minutes. While it is evident that the, the Nauvoo record books that Clayton was copying additional council documents, such as letters, the, uh, the later original and fair copies reveal just how extensively Clayton relied on such documents. Okay, pause. So for these Council of 50 Minutes, he's, again, 
using other sources, other minutes, rough minutes, letters, notations to compile what we're going to find in this Council of 50 record. So For this example, is showing us his methods, his methods his pattern. and story is what we're... Yeah, you might like, think this, this is, is tedious and boring, it. and I admit it's extremely tedious and extremely boring. However, it's critical to understand his work here, to understand what I think we're going to see. Going to see. In fact, I know we're going to see in the Nauvoo Journal. For example, it appears that instead of noting who was present in, in his original minutes, Clayton relied on it on an attendance role, which he later used to record the names of attendees when he produced the fair copy of the minutes. Additionally, Clayton appears to have relied on written motions submitted to the chair to help formulate his minutes. In, in, in his rough minutes, Clayton simply numbered the motion, named the council members who had offered it. In the fair copy, he then transcribed and paraphrased the written motion. In addition to cleaning up the language and format of the original minutes as he prepared the fair copy, Clayton actively reworked his minutes to better conform to parliamentary order and to produce an administrative focus by summarizing or leaving out some of the remarks captured in his rough minutes. Nevertheless, a comparison between these original minutes and the copy in the record book reveals that Clayton made a number of changes to the minutes, adding or deleting words and phrases in an attempt to clarify or polish the text. Although Clayton began keeping minutes for the council in 10 March 1844, he did not begin the council's record book until the summer of 1844. This is after Joseph is dead. At one, one o'clock in the morning on 23rd June 1844, Clayton was summoned by council member John P. Green to J.S. Joseph Smith's home. Joseph Smith had received a letter from Illinois Governor Thomas Ford insisting that he and other men charged with the destruction of the Nauvoo Expositor surrender to authorities. Fearing they would not receive justice, Joseph Smith determined to cross the Mississippi River during the night. Clayton stated that when he arrived at Joseph Smith's home, Joseph whispered and told me either to put the records of the kingdom into the hands of some faithful men and send them away or burn them or bury them. I don't know that I believe, by the way, that Joseph told him to preserve them in any way because none of the other clerks say that. All of the other clerks, as we'll see, um, say they were told to destroy them, but neither here nor there. This is what he says Joseph says. Clayton returned home and immediately put the records in a small box and buried them in his garden. Around five o'clock that morning, Clayton returned to Joseph's office and gathered all the public and private records together and buried them. Richards received similar instructions from Joseph to destroy the records root and branch. So Richards was told, don't leave anything. But apparently Clayton was told, yeah, you can you can hang on to them. Just keep them safe. Joseph apparently worried that the papers of the Council of 50 would be confiscated and used against him. Joseph apparently worried that, uh, excuse me, in February 1845, Richards told the council that following these instructions, he had destroyed the council papers in his possession, which may explain why only one routine council paper for 1844, an apology for absence by Alman Babbitt on 5 May 1844, survived. Clayton apparently felt that the immediate danger of the council papers being confiscated passed after the murder of Joseph on the 27th of June, 1844. On the 3rd of July, Clayton dug up the records that had been buried, noting that water had got into the place where they were and they were damaged. By mid-August, the immediate issue of who would succeed Joseph as leader of the church in Nauvoo had been settled in favor of the Quorum of the Twelve, and Clayton had begun to meet with them and other church leaders as church affairs gradually resumed. On the 15th of August, after attending a meeting with the Twelve, the Nauvoo House Association and the Temple Committee, the core group that initially formed the Council of Fifty, Clayton noted that a very good feeling prevails in the breasts of the brethren. Around this time, Clayton began working on the first record book of the Council of Fifty. On 18 August 1844, Clayton wrote in his journal that he spent the day at his office copying the record of the kingdom. On 6 September, he again noted spending the day copying the record. For the initial 10 March entry in the record book, Clayton must have had access to the original letters from George Miller and Lyman White or a later copy because he began copying the letters into the record book because the original minutes of the council meeting from 1014 to Mar March 14 had been burned. Clayton then reconstructed brief accounts of these meetings using his journal, memory, and possibly other documents. Beginning with the entry in the record book for the 19 March 1844 meeting, Clayton was apparently working from original minutes or notes as the minutes became longer and more detailed. Still, on only a few uh, 1844 entries approached the level of detail contained in the 1845 entries, yada yada, and on 1st of March, the council voted that the minutes be destroyed. I wanted to point that out because this destruction of these minutes is a continual theme that Clayton ignores. After which okay. Clayton put them. 
Well, well, you finish, then I have several questions. Yeah, go ahead and finish it then. After which Clayton put them in a stove uh, and burned them up. For this example, as well as from later Utah era minutes, it appears that Clayton's production of the minutes may have gone through three stages, at least some of the time. First, he took rough minutes during a meeting. Second, he prepared a loose copy to be read in the next meeting. And third, he made a fair copy of the minutes in the record books. Okay, so he was keeping his okay. own little record. No matter what he was destroying, he kept his own minutes and his own records behind the scene. And then he would transfer whatever he had into this, what's called a clean and fair copy. As the okay. council met more regularly in March and April 1845, Clayton dedicated more time to copying the minutes. According to his journal, from 6 March to 28 April, he spent 20 days copying minutes. He's very actively engaged. You see this in his own journal, his Nauvoo journal. I spent the day copying the records of the kingdom, spent the day copying the records of the kingdom. He's doing this day after day after day. Clayton so, may have. So can I ask you two questions quickly? Yes. First, does anybody know he's doing this? Because Joseph told everyone to destroy them. Let's I don't find out. The gun if you're... Okay. Let's, let's and then find my out. Other question, do you, and, and you can tell me if I'm asking too soon, do you have any indication of why he would disregard what, why he would do this? I have a speculation, but I'm going to call it speculation. We don't, we don't know exactly, but I, but I have okay. a strong, I have a strong suspicion. Okay. And we'll get Clayton to both may have, of those. Okay. Continue. Yes, we will. Clayton may have begun making the permanent record based on instruction from Joseph Smith or his own accord. That's interesting. He may have, he may okay. have either from Joseph Smith. But it's interesting that they say that. Obviously, you can speculate Wait. they may have, but there is absolutely no indication that Joseph ever told him to do this. And Joseph and, told him to destroy them. So Exactly. Enigmatic okay. statements in the 1845 minutes when the council reconvened suggest that it is possible that neither the council chairman Brigham Young nor the council recorder Willard Richards was aware of Clayton's record. When the okay. council... Re <laughs> And when the council reorganized in February 1845, Lucian Woodruff requested that the minutes of the first councils be read, to which Young responded that, quote, all the minutes were burned up. While Young's statement may refer only to the 14 March 1844 decision to burn the minutes of the first few meetings, additional discussion su suggests that many council members, including George Miller and Richards, interpreted the lack of re records more broadly. Later in the, in the meeting, Miller appears to have questioned Young's statement, quote, in regards to the records, as he, quote, supposed that they had been preserved, but he had learned since that they were destroyed. To this, Richards responded that in accordance with Joseph's instructions, he had destroyed the records. Although Clayton spoke immediately after Richards, he did not correct the statements. On 4 March... Okay. 18... <laughs> so, so the fact that the Joseph Smith papers speculate that, well, maybe Joseph told him, sorry, to, to even put that in the same sentence... If they're going to be fair, they would say it's possible to to speculate that Joseph might have said this, but there is absolutely no evidence that Joseph ever did. So it is curious as to why Clayton is doing this when no one else apparently knows. OK, that's the yeah. fair way to make that statement or to and, not say anything about it. There's no evidence that Joseph Smith told him to. So you could just leave it out, which would be the most fair and the most accurate way. What, what it does it is it is it doesn't address what is happening here, which we will see. It does not address Clayton himself and his pattern nor his character. On 4 March okay. 1845, Richards proposed that the council allow Clayton, quote, the privilege of taking the minutes and retaining them to copy some names from them before destroying them. Still supposed to destroy them. Um, similar motions were made by Richards on 11 and 18 March, at which point he suggested making it a standing rule of the council that, quote, the clerk be instructed hereafter to burn up all the minutes of these councils as fast as he has done with them until otherwise instructed by the council, end quote. It is unclear whether Richards knew at this point that Clayton was making a complete copy of the minutes or whether he was concerned with the loose minutes, which could be more easily lost or misappropriated. I think we will see that he had no, no idea whatsoever, as we will see. Now, I want to point this out. So on your left, you see the rough minutes that Clayton was taking. On the right, you see for the very same day, the clean minutes. We're going to examine this more closely, but I want to point this out. That, so that this we is step one and two of the three? Is, or there was the rough minutes, then the draft copy, then the clean copy. So yeah, this, this, is, this is rough. These are rough minutes, but he would, 
he would have very at the moment, you know, contemporaneous recording. I think that is step two on the left because it's a little cleaner. And we're going to see how we're going to see what Clayton looks like when he's writing, writing something actually in the moment. We're going to see that where okay. he's writing um, stream of consciousness or or recording something contemporaneously. I want to point out again. Nevertheless, a comparison between these original minutes and the copy in the record book reveals that Clayton made a number of changes to the minutes, adding or deleting words and phrases in an attempt to clarify and polish the text again. He is he feels him as a scribe. He feels liberty to do so, okay, to take okay. things that aren't there and to add them to the clean record. Now, did you catch this? <laughs> did you catch really catch and let it sink in? Nobody knows. Nobody knows that he's doing this. Now they speculate, right. maybe they knew, maybe they knew. I think I can prove that they absolutely did not know. And we're going to see why. Okay. He kept those records. Clayton apparently kept the council records with him until he left Nauvoo in 1846. As they do not appear in inventory made when the church records were packed up for the exodus to the Valley of the Great Salt Lake. In a Records of the Council of Fifty? In wow. April 1847, in winter quarters, Clayton gave the records to Brigham Young, finally, who apparently transported them west. Now, the Joseph Smith papers just kind of make scant reference to this. Oh, well, he had them. We didn't, didn't, they didn't really know. And he just gave okay. them over to Brigham Young. Now, what? Why? Yeah. Alan helps us understand. I'm, these pictures, this guy. Okay. <laughs> okay. This guy you see is a is a is a pretty infamous guy named Hosea Stout. There are some guys, Bill Hickman, Hosea Stout, Orrin Rockwell. These guys need to be understood in order to understand Brigham Young. But John D. Lee. Yeah. John okay. D. Lee as well. I think these guys are 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 arguably far worse than John D. Lee ever was. But okay. Allen says the following about a little incident that happened in 1847. Clayton's reports were certainly not unbiased. Speaking of um, somebody called Hosea Stout, but at least his journal suggests the problems that could occur on such a tri trip. On May 17, 1847, he expressed disappointment with Bishop Miller, who had passed by without leaving him any cattle, though the bishop himself had plenty. A month later, as he rationed out bread to his company, he noted that the men seemed, quote, very much dissatisfied and growled to each other very much. And I have to chuckle because in his journal, he's constantly complaining. <laughs> he is constantly complaining okay. about getting the short end of the stick on stuff. We'll, is. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Such grumbling was not uncommon, but perhaps more serious was the personal animosity between Clayton and at least one other member of the camp. Hosea Stout seemed to dislike the camp clerk with a passion, and the feeling was returned. The reason for the conflict escapes the historian. Oh, James. Okay. I'm sorry that it escapes you. But as Clayton <laughs> saw it, Stout even threatened to kill him. Some potential problems were avoided when, after William Clayton was instructed to go west with the pioneers of 1847, Brigham Young unexpectedly told Stout to remain as the camp of the guard at winter quarters. So he doesn't reprimand Stout. He leaves him in place, but he sends Clayton off uh, to go west. Okay. Now, so from, I, are you going to explain this now? Am I missing some? Okay. Okay. I just, I'm like, I need you to explain that to me. Okay. So for whatever reason, and it's unexplained in the journal, we don't know why Hosea Stout's so upset with him. Okay. We don't know why. All we know is what Clayton says in his journal, and I'll read it. April of the 11th, 1847, on a Sunday, at home at Farr's. That's uh, his father-in-law's house, Diantha Farr's, uh, Winslow Farr, her dad. I told Winslow Farr concern, concerning Hosea Stout's threats to take my life after the 12 are gone, and etc. He called at night on his return from the council and told me to be on my guard. April 13th, 1847, two days later. At home most of the day, Thomas and James started for the farm. Evening, went to the store and told Brigham and Heber about Hosea Stout's calculations and etc. April 14th, the following day, Wednesday. This mor morning, severely, severely pained with rheumatism in my face. At 11 o'clock, Brigham and Dr. Richards came in. B told me to rise up and start with the pioneers in half an hour's notice. Get up and get out. Okay, wait, move across the plains in half an hour's notice. Like, like, 
I couldn't go camping with half an hour's notice. Move, and the, move forever, <laughs> two thousand miles. Okay, I'm okay. So the the day after he says, he's trying to kill me. He's threatened to kill me. They think about it. The next morning, they talk about it with him. Get up and go. You got a half hour. And so then the very next okay. sentence, I delivered to him the records of the kingdom of God. Okay, what explain this to me. In the world, on the same day that Clayton tells Brigham that Stout's trying to kill him, he delivers the records? We'll come back to this. Hold that thought, because this is an important piece of the puzzle that apparently James Allen couldn't put together. Okay. So, summary of Clayton's creation of Council 50 Minutes. He works as a, a clerk. He's the main clerk. Joseph asks him and the other clerks, I submit Joseph did not tell him you could keep them, okay? Mm -hmm. Because all the other clerks had burned them root and branch, as Richard says. But he says I could keep them anyway. He he was asked to destroy but remember, them. Clayton was special. Joseph always was, Clayton was special. Okay, sorry, continue. Of course he was. Clayton didn't burn them. He kept them, used them in other documents to create a clean or fair copy of Joseph's, after Joseph's death. Okay, so he starts this right after Joseph's death in September of 1844 without anyone's knowledge. Clayton held onto these records for over two years and he finally handed them over to Brigham Young in 1847. We'll come back to this later. This is very important. Now, okay. can Clayton's long history, can his long, long history with copying and creating records help us understand his Nauvoo journal better? This is, of course, called the smoking gun. This is what puts Joseph at the scene of the crime. Here's a little intro. So there are two primary journals and a third tertiary uh, James, uh, that comprise the Nauvoo journals. James Allen um, is going to tell us a lot about the substance of the journals. Robert Phillip helps us understand the dating of the journals, which is really, really vital. We're going to examine pieces of the actual journals themselves, things I don't think many people have been able to find. Um, oh, sorry, we're going to examine actual journals, Clayton's actual journals, real journals, not the Nauvoo journals, Clayton's real journals, Richard's real journals, Kimball's and Young's. And then remember, Clayton's copy and documentation creation, creation process um, was part of something called Clayton's private book. He had a private book. Compare that we're going to compare the journals to the Council of 50 record, and then we're going to look at 57 pages that I've been able to find of the actual journal, the actual pictures of the journal itself to see if that can tell oh, us something. Are those on Joseph Smith papers? Is that where you were able to find him? Okay. Yes. They, I don't think they know what they've done. And then why the Clayton Journal is a clean, fair, a later creation, a clean, fair copy, a later creation, and it cannot be said to be contemporaneous. Um, or a diary. And so, all... so in that editorial process, you're saying it's the third step. There were the notes, then the draft copy, then the clean or fair copy. So it's number three. Okay. We're, we're going to see that. And I think we can provide definitive proof of it. And we're also okay. going to examine how his journals are used in the creation of Joseph Smith history and why that's important. So from James Allen, Clayton made the first entry in his three Nauvoo journals on November 27, 1842. For some reason, there is more than an 18 month long gap after the end of the Manchester, uh, an eight month gap, sorry, at the end of the Manchester journal. Though it's possible, even probable, that Clayton kept some kind of record that's been lost. We know that's actually not just probable, it's for certain. Um, the journals are a bit difficult to follow, for the entries are not always strictly chronological. Apparently, Clayton began writing in one journal, moved to another for some reason, then moved back to the original. As a result, the researcher must move back and forth between the volumes. Sometimes there are two entries for the same day, and it's not clear why. Okay, I think we can figure out why, frankly. Now, Robert so Filler... A lot of irregularities. Very strange. The problem. It's a little difficult to follow as James Allen says. Now, Robert Phillip gives us the dates. And we can find these dates. They're buried in the Joseph Smith papers too. We, we, can, we can discern them in other places, but he helps us understand in book one, it covers the period of 27 November, 1842 to 28 April, 1843. And then there's a 17 month gap. And the very next entry in this one volume 
picks up on the 25th of September, 1844 through the 31st of March, 1845. Very strange. This is what Alan's referring to. You have to go from one journal and you go to the other and then you go back to the other. Okay, so now that's Nauvoo Journal 1. Nauvoo Journal 2 covers the gap. Okay, very weird. I, I want to, I like to call it the gap book. So when I call it the gap book, you know which one I'm re referring to, book two. It's the book so, that covers the gap in the in the in the book one. Okay. It goes book from two is a critical period. Sorry, you're gonna just gonna say that. It goes until you can see the day. dates. It's 27, yeah. 27 April 1843 through 24 September 1844. This is a critical time, and we're gonna see how critical this journal is. So then there's a third insight from, from the beginning. Do you have an insight of why William Clayton did that? Did I, I, I'm, the first I, book? I'm going to, I'm going to opine on the subject and people can judge whether or not my opinion has validity. Okay. But, but James Allen just says it's strange. And it's strange. It's just, opinion. it's just okay. strange. Then there's okay. a third that it doesn't have a cover. It's only about, it's 14 pages of actual text, maybe some 15 or 16 pages of paper. It was tucked into the volume one. It was just found tucked in. And it covers a very long period, four years. No, no, no. It's, it, of... it, sorry, I wrote that incorrectly. Oh, that 1444. Should, that oh, okay. should be 44. Okay. That's a clerical error. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a daily record kept by William Clayton. This oh, is from so the JSP. Yeah, that focuses okay. on Joseph Smith's activities during the nine days preceding his flight to Nauvoo. Okay, Clayton's journal okay. contains entries that highlight his own activities on these same days, suggesting that his record on Joseph Smith may be a second authorized journal of Joseph Smith. Authorized journal, um, though no evidence has been found indicating that Smith commissioned Clayton to keep such a record. I love Why how they, they have keep to doing this because it could be this but there's no evidence they, for they want to plant the seed they and... must maintain his credibility okay. at all costs now james allen also can, comments on what we have available to us that's been published that that the notes that andy e hat took that were published by the tanners and that what george smith published later and that philip has published he's going to comment on these uh on what on what is in an intimate chronicle he wrote a review of an intimate chronicle in 1995. It's not very um, flattering. Despite its strengths, several problems are inherent in this publication. Journal 2, when he says Journal 2, he doesn't mean what I mean. He means the entirety of the Nauvoo Clayton journals, okay? Oh, okay. Because uh, George D. Smith uh, gives us six of Clayton's journals, which go from England all the way to the Pioneer Journal, okay? And okay. it has the Nauvoo Temple record and, su and such. Journal two for um, for George D. Smith is the Nauvoo portion, okay? Those which three which oh, is those okay. three, okay? Mm -hmm. if, does that make sense? Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So when, when Alan's referring to Journal two, he's referring to all three together, okay? Despite its strengths, several pro problems are inherent in this publication. Journal two is so incomplete that it cannot be re relied upon to provide a full or balanced perspective. By the way, let me pause for a second. In another, in another uh, podcast, it was on um, RFM's podcast, one of the commentators gave sh brief mention to this that he said, well, Alan kind of complained about the journals. That is so ridiculous, frankly, to to characterize what Alan says. Let's let Alan speak for himself. And well, oh, was this this is Alan? This is he said oh, James was... Allen. James Allen, you know, said they weren't that great. You know, the 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 intimate chronicle. Right. He he kind of tried to give a balanced um, comment to say that J James Allen uh, didn't like what was published, but he didn't explain what James Allen says. That's why I'm going to read this. And it should be noted, James Allen is one of the only people to ever have, well, prior to recently, to ever have worked extensively with Clayton's actual journal. He knows it inside and out. He used it as the source material for the biography that he created on Clayton. And he and, and hasn't Ehat see, seen it as well? Ehat, um, my understanding is he had access to the journals. Whether or not he read them every page, I don't know. Um, okay. He worked from the the typescript that Alan and Dean Jesse made of the journal. He worked from that typescript first, but I think he was also given access. So Ehat saw it. I think Quinn only saw 
either the TypeScript that Alan made or the TypeScript that Ehat made. I'm not certain which. Um, and then recently, we have a team of people supposedly working on the journal. So there's other people that have access to them now, right. but very few people in the public discourse have ever even seen these. Okay? Right. And James Allen's so in his 90s. Of, okay. So, uh, so for me to understand what you're reading here, so this is James Allen commenting on what was published of William Clayton's journals from the notes that got out. Correct. That's, He's commenting okay, on so George D. Smith's in the Intimate Chronicle which is all anyone has had access to publicly. Okay. okay. And he's going to tell us what is contained in that and why he has trouble with it's it. Problematic. Okay. He says, the most problematical document in this collection is Journal 2, Nauvoo, Illinois, 1842 to 46. That's those three volumes I mentioned. Mm -hmm. The original three volumes, which comprise this journal, are owned by the LDS Church and cover the period of 27 November 1842 to 30 January 1846. Scholars should be wary of this abridgment. However, for the editor did not have access to the original journals. Instead, he relied for the most part on highly selected excerpts compiled in 1979 by Andrew Ehat as notes for his specific research interests. And Ehat, who you see on your screen, was a was a grad student at BYU and was this was during Leonard Arrington. And they, they had this brief period of great openness in the church archives, which they later learned they don't want to do again because, uh, you know, things leak out. And several scholars, including Mike Quinn and Andy E. Hatt and James Allen and, and others, Dean Jesse and others were given access. I believe Van Wagner was also given access as well. Anyway, they got in there and they all had their various interests that they were researching. And Andy E. Hatt, was very interested in the Clayton journals and he, and he combed through Alan's typescript and excerpted from the typescript. And then was also given access apparently to see the journals themselves, how much he, time he had with them. I don't know. Unfortunately, so Alan, Alan has a typescript and we don't have access. To Alan that. has the only all full one have, that yes, the only full one ever that. made apparently is Alan's and he has never released it because he has been faithful to the church's request to keep it secret and maybe he turned it over maybe he doesn't even have it in, in his possession but that typescript was made and it's never been released okay. alan continues unfortunately and though through no uh, direct fault of ehats these excerpts were purloined and copied in an unauthorized way by yet another person and he kept it in an office where he was officing uh, with a with a, a bishop on BYU campus. And for whatever reason, other people came into the office, found the notes, and they took them, made photocopies of them, and they circulated like wildfire. <laughs> I have to I have to say, like, my heart breaks for Andrew E. Hat. I oh, think what happened to him was so absolutely it's horrible. Yeah. And and I heard him on on an uh, in some um historians group setting talking about it. You can tell this was extremely heartbreaking for him because of his right. because because of how this got out, and uh, he still is affected by it today. And he and and I like what Alan said that he was he was doing specific research. He only we don't even fully understand why he chose the excerpts he chose, but it certainly should not be used as a fair representation of the Clayton Journal and the fact that it has been used by historians to make this entire narrative. Despite what I, I mean, this whole thing is insane. It's so problematic. As he continues, like the proverbial feathers tossed to the wind, duplicates spread rapidly. The excerpts were eventually published, unapproved, with no editing, in a photo duplicate by, form by Gerald and Sandra Tanner's Modern Microfilm Company of Salt Lake City. That later went to court, and the Tanners actually won, um, that they had a right to publish it. Smith's abridgment is based almost entirely on that source, with some additions from a few other sources. Smith's introduction to, by the way, if you want to read the best one, it's Robert Fillerup, because what Fillerup does is he he extracts from all of Alan's writings where Alan actually quotes from the journal because Alan's quoting directly from the journal. And that and many of the quotes Alan uses are not in the Andy E. Hat excerpts. So Fillerup compiles it all. So if you want to read the best one that's available, it's Fillerup. OK, I'll attach it below because it's available online on archive.org. So, so it'll be in the links. Um, Smith's introduction to this journal leaves some misleading impressions about its full content. He says, for example, that the EHAT excerpts comprise approximately one half of the original holograph journal. 
Since, however, he never since he never saw the holograph, however, he had no way of knowing that there are actually 1,170 daily entries in the three journals. Smith provides a full or nearly reproduction of 102 entries, 8.7%, and partial reproductions of another 254, 21.7%. Considering all the emissions from the partial entries, it is safe to estimate that less than 25% of the whole is included in this publication. Scholars should be very cautious when they try to interpret what is there, for 75% of the whole is missing. Moreover, in the case of the Nauvoo journals, George Smith took no real part in the abridgment. All he had before him were Ehas excerpts, which were never intended as an abridgment. They were merely verbatim notes to be used in Ehat's writing. They were not meant to be published as a collection. What was finally published in, by Modern Microfilm, unfortunately, was an agglomeration of unconnected, except as they related to Ehat's studies, and out-of-context excerpts that piqued the interests of the curious because they seemed somewhat sensational. Now, I don't think they seem somewhat sensational. They are extraordinarily sensational. Uh, so, sorry, James, I disagree with you. Smith correctly observes that Clayton's journals were the source for many entries in the documentary history of the church edited by B.H. Roberts, but he wrongly suggests that most of the 1843-1845 entries are present in edited form in that history. Actually, for the period before the death of Joseph Smith, only about 25 of the daily history of the church entries are clearly drawn from Clayton's journals. We're going to see it's quite a bit more than that in the whole of the history, but we'll see. But are these journals, and why would it matter if they weren't? So let what Alan sinks in, just let that help us be a little more cautious, just a little more when we're examining these, and and let the one of the only men who has had extensive access to them, has made a full typescript, really understands the journals inside and out, let, let his words speak and let them be considered. Can I now. also make another point here that I find just fascinating? Yeah. So this whole mess happened, right? Like this is a mess. The church has to acknowledge, no, has to know this is a mess, right? Yes. You would think that it's like, oh shoot, we let all of this out. This just happened. Oh, well, I guess we better just release the journals now to put this all to rest, right? This is why this so, creates adverse inference. Right, right. Because the fact that they're like this mess, this mess is better than what's in the actual journals is really problematic for all of us to consider. And it's important to also recognize, even in what Alan is saying, he is a consummate apologist. His entire, everything about him is being an apologist for the church and an apologist for Clayton with a determination to, to believe Clayton that, that, that borders on worship in his own words, right? So everything that Alan says, we have to also view through that lens. It is insane that the, all of this happened and the church is like, nope, you can't see the rest. You just make your assumptions about them. And we have to know that whatever assumptions we're going to make about them is not as bad as what they actually contain. It Alan will give us, he'll give us further context uh, in a few minutes about the journals themselves to help us balance them out. And it is critical to understand. And I think, by the way, what Clay, what Alan admits helps us to understand why the church is not, has not released them. Okay. Okay. At least a little. Now what you see on your are screen. Are you coming to that or are you telling yes. us now? Okay. Okay. No, we're coming to that. That's uh, <laughs> it's an important piece. This so much is suspense in this presentation, Jeremy. This is from Brigham Young's actual journal. Um, this is what an actual journal looks like. If you there, are, I think there are three of his journals that we have. Um, they're just a mess. They're like a normal journal, like mine. My journals, you, I can't even read my journals half the time um, because I'm, I'm I'm just I'm getting stuff out and ah, and I go back and read it. What the heck did I write on that day? Right. Well, Brigham's is kind of that way. And so is Heber Kimball's. Heber, Heber Kimball's is a real mess. It's just, uh, you know, it's like what you'd expect. Sometimes doodling, scratching, uh, recording certain kind of things that happen. And and uh, it's very messy. It's very much an actual journal. And, of course, when we look at Willard, Willard Richard's journal, Willard's is even worse than theirs. Here's, his is really, okay. really sloppy and messy. And it's day to day. And it's actually a journal. And even when I mean, we look at... Where can people access these pages? Those are all in the church history library. Okay. 
Okay. okay. You can find all of those journals, the actual pages in the church history library um, so online. Just Google search yeah. church history library. Yeah, go, William and go, journal, go download you them. You can, okay. they let you download them. So long as you don't use them for, com for commercial purposes, then you can actually have the, a copy of it and you can, you can go try to read it. It's really hard to read. You know, okay. this, this is hard stuff. This is Clayton's own journal, as we showed before. This is from his mission journal, his actual day-to-day -day recording. And by the way, in this journal, one of the ways you can tell it's a journal because he's actually talking about himself, revealing things about himself that maybe he might not want out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that somebody okay. else has to come in later and has to scratch out. You can see just one small redaction. There are much, much, much larger we, redactions. We have 12 pages of people scratching stuff out. Yes. And so okay. this helps us understand what a contemporaneous record looks like and remember the importance of a contemporaneous record that can actually be used in court. And a contemporaneous record in the historical sense is what we rely on the very, very, very most. And journals are one of those things we rely on the most to help us understand what was actually going on. What's going on in the mind of the person? Does it corroborate with other things that are happening on the outside, with letters, with newspapers, with other people's journals? You know, a contemporaneous record and later memoirs, later memoirs do not hold the same weight in understanding the history. So I'm thinking of I'm thinking of myself, like the humiliation you feel when you go read your 13 year old journal that you hope your kids, you know, me as a girl, like so and so is so rude. And so and so, you know what I mean? Like that's what it's that's the value of a contemporaneous journal. If I were to write my life history, I would just I wouldn't go into that 13 year old journal. Right. And so that principle continues once you have the historical mindset and you're in a completely different place with a completely different set of motivations and worldview, you clean it up to make it very different than what the actual journal would have told you. So that's why this is so important. I, I, I just want people to really understand the difference there. Like so that messy daily record that you're keeping, that's just whatever mood you're in versus the later, I'm going to clean this up. It's a big, big difference. It's a huge difference. And I think anyone who is discerning at all can discern between something that's written like a journal and something that's not. Now, can we tell? Can we tell if these are or are not contemporaneous records? Now, one thing that can help us, I believe, is looking at the work of actual scribes. How, how their work determines the kind of record that they're creating and can we determine from their penmanship what yeah. kind of record they're creating? For example, Thomas, Books, Thomas Bullock, who was one of the primary clerks, both at the end of Joseph's life and through the Brigham, Brigham Young administration, very key figure in creating the history of the church. This is from his own journal. I This is mess. ridiculous. Good it almost looks like that. Egyptian. It looks like Sanskrit. It's <laughs> it's crazy. Um, it's a and crazy. And the lines aren't even. And the yeah, just okay. This is from a letter that he wrote to William Clayton in 1853. By the way, it's a very very important letter. Very important letter. I, I don't have time to get into it, but it re reveals so much about William Clayton. But this one's even really hard. This is a letter, and apparently William yeah. could read it. It's really hard to read. Then. You look at his minutes when he's recording some, this is some semi-official, this is this is rough minutes from a, from an actual contemporaneous note, notes that he took of, of the April 1844, the 6 through 9 conference. Um, so this, this is, is, this is cleaned up. This isn't the contemporary, this isn't the actual notes. This is, yeah, we don't, we don't know when he recorded this. We have no idea. Um, but this looks like what I have to read when I'm trying to get Hiram's speech from. Yes, this is Hiram. This is actually Hiram's okay. speech. It's really hard to read. And it's hard to read. Record of it that we and have and yet LCS this is page. cleaner than the previous two. Okay. Right. So this even. OK, so he this clean, one he, could have been cleaned up, though, is what is. But, yeah, but I think what this indicates is he is actually he's not being meticulous uh, in the degree that we'll see that he can. This gives some indication that I think that he's either doing this in a hurry, somewhat in a hurry, or um, he's not doing this for an official record. This is a draft of yeah, some kind. Okay. But it this still is, is much cleaner than the first. Much cleaner. Now look at this. Okay. Now you can read wow. this clearly. This is a letter to his yeah. wife, Henrietta. And you can tell by this letter, he loves this woman. And, this and is he, the same guy. Okay. This, this is Bullock's writing to his, to his wife okay. in 1857. In 1848, this is a blessing. An That's official beautiful. blessing that he gave her. Now, this is a 
think of think of their mindset about blessings okay these are mm-hmm. these are official recordings to be something to be kept and preserved and look at how gorgeous his writing is okay it's absolutely stunning how he can write and if you go back to the original and compare it and this is um from the history the official history book that he was working on with richards this is the this is um the official pre-print draft okay that they would later serialize and print in the papers it is gorgeous writing this man has a talent for penmanship okay that's that's thomas yeah. bullock now Willard if he Richards, can write like that it's almost like he didn't want the previous ones to be read by almost other almost, almost like or, he's or, he's, or he's writing so fast he's writing in his own code there are things yeah. i write that i can read that nobody else can read okay and this sure. is richards in his own journal it's just a mess okay. absolute mess this is richards in joseph's Quote Joseph's journal. Much better. One of the reasons why this is not a journal is it's not that. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. Richard's writing a journal journal. Likely, as as we learned, he would write notes. His notes probably look like this. This is a little mm-hmm. cleaner. Okay. It's more legible. You can read every word. Sometimes you gotta strain because you gotta know how he writes. This you is know a what? I'm going to say, I think that the notes of Joseph's journal would be even worse because when you're writing your own journal, you can at least do it when you have time. You can yes. sit down and think. Well, you're when following him around and you're recording. The fly, he's following exactly. him. He's not. Yeah. So I think that that would have been even messier. Okay. This is a letter in 1846 to the camp of Israel. It's much cleaner. It's mm-hmm. uh, much more orderly. It's still a little, it's, you know, it's similar to this. Not perfect. Okay. Okay. And this is mm-hmm. uh, from the, the history draft. Same thing. Mm-hmm. This is his level of where he's getting pretty good. And this, um, is a letter to Thomas Ford where it's much cleaner. Okay. So he has the ability to write pretty clean. Okay. And then in case anyone's going to say, I hope people are looking at the dates at the bottom in case anyone's going to be like, well, they learned to write better. Like it was a progress over time, like a child in high high writing class. No, this is merely about how important or how finished on, on which cop, which, which form of writing they're using for what purpose, right? This is about the best Richards gets. And this happens to be, a copy of the supposed July 12th, 1843 revelation on celestial marriage. And I wonder if anyone looking at this realizes the significance of what I just said, that there yeah. happens to be a copy of the July 12th, 1843 re- revelation on celestial marriage in Richard's handwriting. We're not going to take time to go through this. We're going to do that oh. later because it plays in hey. later in another episode. But just let that ring around let in me- your head. Let me just make this point quickly, because it was just in my last episode that I mentioned this, that I just mentioned it. But from Clayton's own copy, the original was destroyed after two days, which begs the question of what exactly Hiram read and went across the street to get to read. Right. But no one seems bothered by that but me. But anyway, and then he says that no one knew about the secret um, Bishop Whitney copy that Kingsbury made. So the fact that Willard Richards has a copy is Highly is just bananas, bonkers. Where in tarnation did this thing come from? And when was it written? Uh, by the way, Brian Hales, Brian Hales thinks this was written in 1843, and the church thinks it was at some point. He just says, At some point, well, he said, He said, He says, He he, he's got in a document he wrote 1843, and the church also says 1846. When we don't know, but this one exists, we'll come back to that later. Now. Anyway, Joseph it Kingsbury. Is tro- it is it is troubling. Yeah. Yes. I jo- should say it's not troubling to us. It's troubling pl- troubling to that narrative. It doesn't fit. It, they haven't woke Lucy, well you got some explaining to yeah. do. So <laughs> you've got uh, Joseph Kingsbury in 1859 and a letter that he's writing. This is sloppy as can be. It's to Brigham Young. And this is a letter to Brigham Young. Uh, oh, then wow. you've got a day book that he kept in Joseph Smith's store. By the way, this is why he gets into the picture because he worked for Newell Whitney. He was a clerk for Newell Whitney who kept the the store that Joseph Smith owned. Okay. And you can see it's a little cleaner, but it's still pretty sloppy. Then from his personal history, you can read every word much cleaner. Mm -hmm. And then you copy, you compare that to the infamous revelation on celestial marriage, July 12th, 1843. The thing we mentioned, that's beautiful. He can write with a beautiful pen, okay? And you okay, can read every now, word. Now, one thing I'm just assuming is that writing this beautifully takes longer than the sloppy chicken scratches. <laughs> we right? don't have time to go into that, but absolutely. Because that plays into the narrative we're going to discuss in part four. 
Oh, so we're Absolutely. not mentioning that here. Okay, more suspense that's, that's, for all That's of you. to come. Okay. So with each scribe, right. the penmanship improves according to the importance of the document. Okay. With okay. every scribe, it improves with the importance of the document. Just keep that in mind. The contemporaneous journals, journals and minutes are markedly different from that. the more official, pristine, and clean writing from each one of these clerks. And my computer is going a little slow, so this is popping up a little, yeah, up uh, a a little bit okay. uh, clunky. That is, so you yeah, get the point. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is a pattern shown over and over again by each clerk. So do Cl Clayton's writings tell a similar story? Well... Here's his journal. Oh, okay. okay, this is it's really hard to read him. Really, really hard. That's his Manchester journal. This is the rough council of 50 minutes in 1846. It, you can read it a little more, but it's still kind of rough. Better. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you have other minutes. This is a little cleaner. Okay. This is a more uh, a cleaned up cleaner, copy, actually. but boy, some of his words are hard to, you have to really get used to, to, to reading Clayton in this kind of hand. Then you've got his April, 1844, uh, conference minutes by the way he doesn't record Hiram's sermon in this in this i think uh, as we right. may have mentioned he doesn't record this at all but this is his recording of those uh sermons this is um i believe the where the king follett discourse comes from okay and and clayton okay. has his own copy of it and then the trustees land book you see his writings much cleaner in the trustees land book this is an official capacity clerk writing he's doing this for uh, in, uh as the um the, uh, working for the trustee and trust, which was Joseph Smith. Okay. These are, t these are records that are important. Records Recording land kept. deeds and all kinds of things. Okay. Land transactions. It's a letter to James Arlington in 1842. This is quite, this is quite nice. He's not quite the penman of the others, but he can write really cleanly and, and, um, really legibly and in uh in a in a lovely hand i shall say his and writing then, cleans up nicely we'll say right that. Yes. and in in the book of the law of the lord this is nothing like bullock okay he's not nearly as gifted as bullock but this is the book of the law of the lord it's very clean every mm -hmm. word is legible okay this is about the he's trying, this is you can see. this is the zenith for him this is as good as it gets so as you can see william's penmanship just like the other scribes improves with the importance of every document that he's writing a quick review of the council of 50 records and what we've learned about william's pattern number one uh the council of 50 minutes are written in the same type of book as his nauvoo journals clayton would take rough minutes at the meetings then he would reconstruct the brief accounts of these meetings using minutes his journal memory and possibly other documents a comparison between the original minutes and the copy in the record book reveals that Clayton would make a, a number of changes to the minutes from the originals to the fair copy, adding or deleting words and phrases in an attempt to clarify and polish the text. And his uh, record keeping went through three stages. First, rough minutes. Second, a loose copy to, to be read at a meeting. And then third, he would make a fair copy. And so what's a fair copy? Um, Jeremy, referring back to what you, to your legal requirements for a diary to be entered. I'm just, again, like, nope, 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 nope. Right. <laughs> okay. It must be, it must have been done in the, in the regular business of the day. And in a journal setting, that's you're writing every day. It must be authentic and it must be, um, uh, you can't impeach the person who is writing it, meaning they're recording things accurately with knowledge. Okay. And so, mm -hmm. In this setting, if he's taking stuff from a meeting and he's embellishing, this is just the Council of 50 record, where there's probably not that much. This, it's probably innocuous, is my guess. I don't know, but because we can't see all the original minutes. But I don't know why he would have a, a, a need to embellish those records. However, a fair copy, then in this definition, according to Miriam, is a neat and exact copy, especially of a corrected draft. Cambridge says it's the final corrected copy of a uh, of a piece of a written work. Collins says it's an exact copy of a document manuscript after final corrections. So a fair copy is not precisely an exact copy. It's an edited copy. Okay. Um, it's, it's, I think what is fair to say is it's the final draft. You've done all of your draft work and this is the finished version. Perfect. Right? Perfect. And, and, and for, for publication, for keeping mm -hmm. a record for posterity or something of that nature. Okay. This is these are pages from volume one of the Council of 50, volume two of the Council of 50, volume three of the Council of 50. If you flip They're through the beautiful. pages, you see it's it's exactly like this. Every page 
with you know there's some there's some scribbles here and there there's a little things that are, some things that are crossed out and written over but it's very rare and it's very clean it's a it's a pristine record of the events of the council of 50 so making it obvious that it wasn't kept contemporaneously it correct and so Okay. When you look at his contemporaneous minutes or his actual journal mm -hmm. versus the Council of 50, you can see the distinction with what he's doing. And it's very clear when he's keeping a contemporaneous record versus when he's doing what we, we'd call a fair copy. So the, now, the Council of 50 is what Brigham Young used to claim his authority. Let that sink in. Brigham uses this book or these records oh. to claim the authority of the 12, because it's in this record that Brigham claims that Joseph rolled off the keys onto the 12. That's actually not what happened, okay? That's a long subject, too much to go into here. But he uses this, this council, the Council of 50, to claim that's where the 12 gets the keys from Joseph, okay? That's a long story. We, it's for another day. However, Clayton made this record, remember this, without anyone's knowledge. Clayton held on to these records for two whole years and then finally handed them to Brigham Young in 1847 after, just immediately after, his life is being threatened by Brigham Young. And these are a They're neat... by Jose Estout. Yeah. Sorry, by Jose Estout. Thank you. A neat, clean, fair copy of other minutes having been edited and corrected in their final form. So what's the significance of William's creation of the Council of 50 Minutes? Well, one other thing to, to, to note... As I've mentioned, the Council of 50 Minutes, the Nauvoo Journals, and Willard Richards Journals are all there. It's oddly, they all happen to be the same size. I don't think that's that big a deal, but it's just really interesting that two of the primary clerks in this whole thing are using the exact same volumes to create a narrative, okay, or to create okay. something. All right. So these are different than all of their other journals. Okay. And these are the special ones that are that are specifically creating the narrative. That the is Nauvoo journals right. are in are in the exact same type of volume as the books you see on your screen. Okay. The same exact size. They're these little books he's using to create a a, a fair copy. Is there evidence that William followed the same pattern for the Nauvoo journal? Okay. James Allen says the following. Clayton made the first entry in his three Nauvoo journals, November 27, 1842. It's possible, even probable, that Clayton kept some kind of record that's lost. We've read that. Now, Robert Fillerup says Clayton probably kept a, quote, private book or, quote, record or private record while in Nauvoo. The original is not known to exist, but copies of, quote, extracts from William Clayton's private book do exist. See the note and the date, et cetera, et cetera. Then Allen says this, the first record recorded presentation of this idea uh, was to the members of the Quorum of the Twelve on June 27, 1839, as they were preparing for their important mission to England. Apparently, Joseph taught it somewhere. He's talking about detecting spirits. Oh, okay. There's okay. this idea that uh, if you give your shake hand, hand. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a true spirit will not offer their hand to you. A, a devil will try to shake your hand, etc. Okay. Apparently, Joseph taught it somewhere regularly after that. It was first published as a revelation in Deseret News. It was first uh, on April 23rd, 1856, and, an, and in 1876, it was placed in the Doctrine and Covenants as Section 129. Okay. Do we have it earlier than 1856? Um, no. Oh, uh, not, not, okay. pu not published earlier than 1856, okay? But... References to Joseph's teaching this doctrine are found in August 8th, 1839, in December 1840 and in March 21st in 1841. The December 1840 reference is in a curious source titled Extracts from William Clayton's Private Book. The original private book is not available for research. A photocopy of the extracts is available in the Scott G. Kenny Research Collection, J. Willard Marriott Library, blah, blah, blah. The Nuttall paper... Uh, uh, you, John Nuttall also made excerpts from Clayton's private book, but these are incomplete. So now I, that's might be a little confusing, but section 129 of the Doctrine and Covenants was written from the extracts that John Nuttall makes, okay, uh, of William Clayton's private book. We don't have this private book. It doesn't exist, but... Is it 
Okay, it, it's it does it's not just not available for research. It's been no one it's... knows where it is. That doesn't mean the church doesn't have it. Okay, but it's not known to exist. Okay, so this is not any of his journals. This, this is, is another. Different... This is another journal. This would be okay. this would be called a journal. Okay, or okay. at least a at least a record book, in which Clayton inscribes a bunch of stuff. And one of those things is this teaching that makes its way into the Doctrine and Covenants from Clayton's private book, mind you. Okay. And and what are the dates of this book? Do we know that? We don't know anything about it. All we know is what okay. John Nuttall, John Nuttall later, he's, he's in the historian's office, makes extracts from it. Okay. And those extracts wind their way into the Doctrine and Covenants. Okay. So wow. this is what we know okay. about those extracts. More on that. Extracts from William Clayton's private book is a handwritten manuscript located in the papers of John Nuttall at Brigham Young University. Nuttall's source was apparently a private journal kept by Clayton in which he recorded excerpts from several sermons of Joseph Smith. The extracts are interesting, but they say nothing specific about Clayton. Moreover, whether Clayton actually heard these sermons or whether he copied them from someone else's transcription is unclear. One short entry titled, quote, A Key by Joseph Smith, December 1840, so we don't know if he's writing it on the day or if he's recording it later, deals with, quote, the key by which someone may determine whether a messenger is a spirit of God, is a spirit from God or from the devil. Se uh, on 9 February 1843, Clayton was with the prophet in Nauvoo when he repeated the same instructions as recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 129, 4-9. That passage is actually a word-for-word -word duplication, except for one minor difference of Clayton's Nauvoo journal entry for that date. This entry was the source for the official transcription when it was prepared for the Doctrine and Covenants. The editor of an intimate chronicle could have known this. Okay, so what he's saying is there's this other book. We don't know it to exist. John Nuttall, much later, records extracts from Clayton's private book. One of the things he records is this interesting teaching that Joseph apparently taught on more than one occasion, where if you, you can detect a, 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 one spirit from another, you can detect a true spirit from a false spirit. I'm just going to like acknowledge here, this is a key I've never needed to use. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would be interested to know if anyone has found this to be a useful. I mean, I don't know if it's I, from Joseph Smith or not, but in any case, we, I, I don't use, know. I, I, I have other ways of knowing what in, what spirits are. Frankly, right, his anyway. teaching, his 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 actual verified sermon or write, writing called "Try the Spirits," is far more instructive, in my view, than just holding out your hand which teaches okay, you the way to discern the message of true and false messengers. So, um, oh, is, is however, that in the scriptures or, you know what, if you'll send me that link, I'll include it because people might try the spirits, uh, try the spirits. I don't know. It's J the JSP has it. Um, okay. that's an actual verified teaching by Joseph Smith that was never canonized by the LDS church. So, okay, um, we'll link but it's that, a very important I have a teaching. It might be a little more useful. Yeah. That that's might really, be a little really important, applicable. but nonetheless, okay. what you find is you have, an original cop uh, writing a recording of this in an earlier book that we don't have. John Nuttall has an extract, but then we also have a recording in Clayton's journal of apparently the same thing. Did he use the extract to reconstruct the journal? Was he really with the prophet on the day? Don't know, but the fact exists. Could the private, could the private book be one of those draft copies, like level two? Oh, we don't know anything. We can't. Okay. We can't examine it. But the, but the fact exists, there was another record that Clayton kept that we don't have. So when we say Clayton's, quote, journal, what, what people typically think when you, they think your journal, they think this is the, this is the book that I re record my notes, my thoughts, my feelings, my experiences, okay? And usually when someone has a journal, they're not, they're not recording four journals simultaneously. For different purposes, maybe. I mean, maybe you might, might have a spiritual thoughts journal. You might have a daily activities journal. I don't know. You might have salacious details journal. I don't know. But typically people aren't doing that kind of thing. Okay. He has this book. We don't know what the time frame that it covers, but we know that it did or does exist. Okay. So. 
and that, that we get structure from it. So that's good for everyone to know that. <laughs> I mean, I think many people know that 132 isn't the only questionable late entry into Doctrine and Covenants. It's useful to check everything that was added in 1876 and try to discern where they came from. Well, it's actually, some valid stuff it's there, even but. more than that. There, the, the Doctrine okay. and Covenants has lots of interesting things that need to be investigated, I think. And, and that's for other people for another day to talk about. Okay. So the fact that this exists is a very important uh, piece of this puzzle. Does it still exist? Does the church is it still in the possession of the church? Are there any other records that Clayton has that the that the church is is withholding? Okay, if so, the church should release them immediately. If they do, okay. Now, verifiably, Clayton used rough minutes, letters, his memory, and other documents to create the Council of Fifty records. Did Clayton use a similar process to create the journals? Given what we've exposed about these journals, given um, what there wasn't, that there wasn't is a private book, a private journal, what are the chances the journals were recorded contemporaneously? Now, remember um, James Allen's warning, the journals are, are, are difficult to follow. They don't follow a chronological order. They're problematic. Scholars should be very wary. Okay, remember that warning. Remember that William Clayton's penmanship improves with the importance of the document. If we're looking at his Manchester Journal versus his Council of 50 Minutes, if we're looking at page after page after page. So we of, can, all of these, we're comparing the, the rough draft, the, the this, contemporaneous to the more finished draft. Well, on the left, what you see is his Manchester Journal, his actual journal. Yeah. He's doing a real journal versus when he's writing a fair copy. Okay. Can this I just is ask what you it looks like. Question? Yeah. Does a fair do his fair copies ever include things about raisins or ginger lozenges? I'm just... <laughs> and she gave me I'm... two two pence and a peck on the cheek. <laughs> I'm just curious no. if he's he's a little more careful, right? It's it's the difference between, uh, like I mentioned before, that was it in this recording that I talked about the 13 year old journal, or is that what we went back and did that? Did well, I delete that? Uh, now. Uh, to the 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 other side would say, well, he's very he's very honest about stuff that he does in his Nauvoo journal. Sure, because he doesn't see any problem with it. <laughs> right? He doesn't think he's doing anything wrong. He right. just he has he he is utterly clueless about his own situation and station, and so well, it's. It's similar to the um, affidavits written in Utah by these older women now. What they thought they were, this was in a context, I went, I'm trying to get people to understand, this was in a context context where sacrifice for the principle was the highest good. So the greater sacrifice you made, the more faithful you were. They weren't writing these things trying to say Joseph Smith was bad. They were writing them saying, look at the sacrifice I made for the principle with this kind of lack of awareness of how later people would read that and what that would say about Joseph Smith. Absolutely. So it's a similar thing that you have to get into their mindset. Like Clayton wasn't being honest. He was being faithful to what he was doing. Well, when I say honesty, when he's recording things about himself in his mm -hmm. Nauvoo journal, I think he's being perfectly honest about himself. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so as we look at the things he records contemporaneously with the things he records officially, we can see it. It's very, very different from his conference minutes to his Council of 50 records. On the left side, you see a letter. This becomes more official to his council. This is this is where it's similar. An official letter, mm -hmm. an official Thank document. And then another official letter in the official document. And then the book of the law of the Lord. This is where it's most close, okay? The 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 level of uh of clean penmanship, the way the writing is done, um, the official nature of the document. This it parallels the book of the law of the Lord, the Council of Fifty record does. So on the left, I'm seeing the book of the law of the Lord, or on the left, I'm seeing the Council of Fifty, and on the right, I'm seeing... No, nope. on the left, you're seeing the book of the law of the Lord, the big one. That's the big mm -hmm. book. And on the right, you're seeing the Council of Fifty record. Okay, okay. okay. And they both look uh -huh, fair. They, they both look like fair copies. They, they, they are both fair copies, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so that pattern through the Council of Fifty record applies. It's it's an official document on the right hand side as opposed to a contemporaneous con con contemporaneously recorded document. Now, where would Clayton's journal fall? So can a comparison help us understand? So let's take a look. Let's compare the Council of 50 record 
with actual pages from his actual journal side by side. And on one side, you have the Nauvoo Journal. There's an actual page from the Nauvoo Journal in front of you. And on the other side, you have a page from the Council of 50 record. Now, people seeing this go, what's the big deal? Well, take a look. Look and see if you can tell the difference. I have switched them up. And so you can see if you can figure it out. One is one and one is the other. Which one would be the Nauvoo Journal and which one would be the Council of 50 record? Those are pretty clean. I can't see a journal there, especially if you had it up next to his rough stuff. No, 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 you can't tell. Okay. One is the Council of 50 and one is the Nauvoo Journal. And there are page after page after page like this. But can you, okay. can you distinguish which one is a contemporaneous no. record from which one is a fair and clean copy? I defy any of the historians to explain this away, to explain it away. Like one, these are both fair copies. They're both they're clean, both pristine, and they're they're and by the way, remember they're produced in the exact type of volume. Okay, remember when Clayton starts recording the Council of Fifty record? It's shortly after Joseph dies, and I think that gives us a clue as to when he likely started copying his Nauvoo journal because this is a copy, folks. This is a copy. This is not a journal. You are seeing pages from his journal on each, but these are the side-by-sides with the Council of 50 record. And what you can see is you cannot tell the difference. If you don't know what you're mm -hmm. reading, you do not know which one comes from which. And I defy any of the historians to, to tell me what this is about. Okay. To okay. So let me just, let me just make sure I'm on, 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 on up with you right now. The Council of 50 is his best work. It's his most pristine, like scripture keeping type. It, it lines close. up with okay. it lines up with his best work with his with the most okay. official letters with the book of the law of the Lord. It's clean like that. He's not a great okay. penman. He's not he's not he's I mean, not amazing. Right. But this is the best that he gets right here. And then we have his journal or his his contemporaneous, which are an absolute mess, right? And then also, what I wanted to point, what I want would, would be curious to investigate are a couple of things. During Joseph's life, he was busy. He was keeping Very. him. He was he was doing a million things after Joseph's death is when he was finalizing his records for the Council of 50 Minutes, and that's recorded often. So you are saying the most likely scenario you can see is that he was doing both of these in a similar time period after Joseph's I death. I believe that he starts recording his Nauvoo journal at the same time or sometime close to when he's recording the Council of 50 min Minutes for a purpose, as we will see here shortly. So on these yeah, pages here... On the left, you mm -hmm. see this is the Council of 50 record. On the right, you see his Nauvoo journal. The page, this is one page. And I, fortunately, I would have never known. If you know what you're looking at in the Joseph Smith papers, you can find references um, in various things. They just leak out. It, it, I found these because I was looking up a, one of Joseph's discourses. And under, if you know, if you've looked at the Joseph Smith papers, they have a section called Additional Versions. And under Additional Versions, they'll list who else recorded. Uh, the discourse or that event. And in a number of cases, like December 21st, 1842, or January 22nd, 1843, you'll notice you can see these are from the William Clayton Journal. Okay, so they, they're there. They, they buried them. They're hard to find. But if you search for them, you can find, I found 57, there might be more. But 57 actual them? pages on the Did Joseph Smith papers. Clayton? Well, I, I, I noticed it once and I thought, are you kidding me? This is the, okay. the journal no one's seen. Yeah. Because previous to that, the only page that I'd ever seen was this page that has a kinder, kinder hook plate on it. And I'll show mm -hmm. that here in a second. But I could not believe that they had inadvertently put 57 pages here under these sections. As you can see, okay. and I'm going to show you the actual pages. I want you guys to see these pages so you can see I have a representation of pages from all three volumes of the journal from the from that Nauvoo period. And so they represent different spans in the journal. So it's not from one little chunk. It's from the entire span of the whole thing. So you can tell that he's consistently recording this in the exact same way that he recorded his Council of 50 Minutes. It okay, is the same me... type of work as he did with the Council of 50 Minutes. All of um, these are right in the Joseph Smith papers. 
Absolutely. Another thing I'm not seeing, and you can correct me, but I'm not seeing blank lines and blank pages. None. Which that was in the middle version, right? We have the sloppy notes, then the middle version. This is the finalized version without the empty the empty pages to add correct. later. That's From another journal, huge evidence. One hundred percent. He's not doing what he and Richards are so want to do. And in in uh, and by the way, um, he doesn't have blank spaces or pages in his in his Manchester journal either, but that one is mm -hmm. sloppy. The, the words are smushy there. The, there's lines on the page. There's edits. They're, there's all kinds like of They're like Joseph's things. earlier scribes. It's the, it's a contemporaneous one. That's not intent. That's not premeditated. To so it doesn't altars. fit. It doesn't fit either the contemporaneous journal or a draft. This is a, this is almost a finished the work finalized. for him. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 22 <gasps> pages hey, from the just, journal. Everybody. Yeah? Like, please tell me that you are getting this. This is so huge because it's not just your opinion. You are showing right here. Answer this. Explain this. There's the pattern. We have it all. This is the finalized. This is the version to turn in to the history. Like, this is kind of like the church history version when it's finalized. After the things have been cut out, after all of the decisions have been made. This is amazing. Okay, keep going. I, I just want to really let that settle for people. What it is that you're showing us here. Absolutely. This is huge. So as we're scrolling through these, just take a look at each page from 27, 28, 29, the pages in the 40s, pages in the 50s. These are throughout the journal, scattered throughout. Okay, the, the Joseph Smith papers has given us sections from various parts of the journal, but we can see it's consistent. This is all book one. Okay. And every single page is like this. Every page is clean and pristine, just like the Council of 50 record. It all has the exact same features that we saw with the Council of 50 record. And I, by the way, I invite you to go to the Joseph Smith papers, download the Council of 50 record. Also, just search William Clayton. You will find these if you know how to search for them. They're, they're not hidden. They're, they're not, they're not rather, they are they are hidden in plain sight. Let's put it that yeah. way. I don't think they. I don't think they really want to have these out there, but They're they like put the them out there. Topics, <laughs> right, because these these pages have to do with important sermons that Joseph gave or certain things. Now these pages here. This is from book two. Okay, this is what I what I like to call the gap book. Okay, and we'll come back to the that gap book and how important that is. But again, you see exactly the same thing. Page 13, 14, 15 page 16 and 18. By the way, those of you who are saying, oh, it's so big deal. So it's perfect. Oh, no. Some people write really well. You go, you show me your journal. Well, and show me the journal Williams. of the, of the most meticulous, um, uh, teenage girl who has beautiful handwriting. It still doesn't look like this. Okay? Also, some days it's in a purple pen. Some days you're really quick and tired. Some days you're, this That's is, exactly you right. cannot see where a page, where a day stops and starts. You He's can't. using the same pen for large sections of this, which means yeah. he's sitting at a desk and he's taking other documents and he's compiling them into a single record. Okay. Well, he's already done. He's already done his middling copy, whatever, his draft copy with the blank lines. And he's already made all of his notes. This is the final Correct. version. Correct. He's already, Correct. It's written before he's copying it. Whether okay. it's in a private book or another journal or minutes he's taking from meetings or a, a letter that he saw, or he's using those other things, just like he did the Council of 50 to create this. This, okay. this brings up another challenge, which is him trading back and forth between books. It, like that's a really interesting question. Hold, hold on, hold on. This. Oh, as uh, hey, more suspense. <laughs> as Murdoch would say, hold on to your butts. So, the, <laughs> from uh, was that Lethal Weapon? <laughs> I can't remember. No, I don't remember the movie. But this is Journal Three. This is the loose little papers that were in in Volume One. We have all fourteen of these. Now the the, oh. the papers are distressed and colored because of weathering because it doesn't have a cover but you'll notice it's exactly the same this is the narrative about joseph's last uh, the nine days previous to carthage okay it's oh, a it's it hasn't it's an official okay, it's like an official record you know of the events and so wow. he's done the exact these same are the thing nine days, these are the nine days before carthage yes. that's really interesting in their very very, own. very important stuff and, and again, the Joseph Smith paper says it's unclear as to whether Joseph authorized this or not. <laughs> I, okay. Joseph was but, dead. Joseph was dead long before this was done. Okay. 
So these 57 random pages that we looked at from all three volumes, they span the length of the entire work and they provide a fair representation of the nature of the entire record. Remember, Clayton's Nauvoo journals are the same size as the Council of 50 and Richard's memo books. And every single page, like the Council of 50 record, is written neatly and appears to be a clean, fair copy. On the top, you see the Council of 50. On the bottom, you see pages from his journals. Remember, oh, Clayton's missing private journal and his pattern of copying rough notes into clean records. The 57 pages reveal that there are also interesting edits at different points in the journal. So for example, on page 65, it has these little notes written in pencil. He, on the day he wrote, do blank, do blank, but then he writes notes, okay? On page 71, um, he also related the following dream. He writes, he also related his dream whatever. He's clarifying the meaning in a subsequent edit. On page 72, he's he's drawing lines. You'll notice in Let the, in the history. Let me ask you, we don't know for sure that Clayton did this. It could have we been have no idea. Well, that's Clayton's hand. That's Clayton's handwriting above that. That looks oh, to be his okay. handwriting. Okay. Um, okay. So he, he, he clarifies. He also related his dream of 10 March. So he adds a date in there. On this page, you see a line through the page in the in the history drafts for the church, you'll notice they'll put lines through pages when they've gone through and they've done their edit for that page or they've or they've checked it. You know, it, we're done with this page, so we're going to put a line through it. OK, um, in, in this other page, there's more simple little notes clarifying um, the words. Uh, we will call on the saints to defend probably all the Western territory. OK, instead of call on your call on you to defend probably the Western territory. He's making edits to even the pristine copy, which is interesting. Do you go back and do you edit your own journal? Yeah. You know, do, do you do that? I mean, maybe, maybe you do. Like, but I this said, is... like I said, if I looked at my 13 year old journal, right. If I made a new copy of like, if when I wrote a later version, that 13 year old journal would not be comp included as it was. And, and in your journal, back. would you make a reference that says see page 82? No, no. Unless it was, no, no, it's bizarre. Why would you do that unless this is a document used to create something else, which we will see mm -hmm. here in a second. Now, why would there be edits in the journal? Okay, now, this is what's called, what they call proof that right. the journal is contemporaneous. There's a page in the journal where Clayton traces something called a kinderhook plate. If you're not familiar with that story, go Google it. You'll figure it out. But it's it's a these record plates just, that- A record that was given to Joseph. Yeah, supposedly- yeah. Um, uh, made Joseph look bad. Fraud. Okay. Right. <laughs> the question is, did Clayton trace this on the day on May 1st, 1843, as it says in the journal, the antagonist, the apologists both agree that this is absolute proof that the journal is contemporaneous. Okay. First, I want to read really quickly what Alan writes about this. So you understand that there's some problems with this recording of this entry in Clayton's journal. And boy, I love Alan. I just love him because he inadvertently admits stuff that really helps us. Some of the entries in the history based on Clayton's journal reveal the potential problems with this kind of history. The story, by the way, he, what he's referencing is Clay, using Clayton's journal to construct Joseph Smith's history, Okay, which we will oh, see oh. more of later. Okay, we're going to see more about that later. Some of the entries in the history, that's Joseph Smith's history, based on Clayton's journal, reveal the potential problems with this kind of history. The story of the infamous Kinderhook plates is an example. On May 1st, 1843, Clayton recorded the following. And then he records, I've seen six uh, brass plates, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to read the whole thing. The same, the same entry with some slight modifications appeared in the history as follows. Okay. I won't read that either just to save time, but they, they record, basically they use Clayton's journal as the, the base text for the history. Okay. That's in Joseph's history. The problem here is that the Kinderhook plates were a hoax. And because we know this, the entry seems to show that Joseph Smith was hopelessly duped. It must be noted, however, that in his diary, Clayton did not quote Joseph directly. He only reported what he thought was happening. 
whether Joseph actually told Clayton that he had translated the plates or whether Clayton was simply reporting what he had heard from a variety of sources is not clear. The latter appears to be the case, especially when one realizes that Clayton's account contains several inaccuracies. The so-called discovery took place in Pike County, not Adams County, and there was no skeleton with the plates, only some bones. Further, William Clayton's account is not consistent with similar account by Parley P. Pratt, which was also probably attained by hearsay rather than from the prophet himself. There's no evidence of any direct statement by Joseph Smith about the authenticity of the plates and no evidence that he ever obtained attempted a translation. As historian Stanley B. Kimball has demonstrated, all kinds of stories about the plates were circulating, but Joseph did not get involved with the plates at all. What is clear is simply the unfortunate entry got into the history before any of its editors knew the truth. Now, I don't want to get into a discussion today about the Kinderhook plates. That's another subject entirely. However, I just want to point out what Alan notes, that there's trouble with the story. And unfortunately, part of the trouble is Clayton himself <laughs> and the fact that Clayton re recorded some erroneous things that then got uh, trusted to be in the official history. Okay, that's number one. Clayton's own entry in the Kinderhook plate is troubling. Number two is, what about Brigham Young, who also made a tracing or sketch of the same thing? However, in his journal, there's a problem. He didn't make the sketch on the day, but the date he puts is on May 3rd, 1843. Now look at the, this is a little strange. These are pages from his actual journal, but his journal's a little weird because he doesn't always, kind of like Clayton, doesn't always record things exactly chronologically. Sometimes he'll be in 1843 and another entry, he'll record something that was said in 1841. Like he'll so go he's back. Doing reminiscences along. Yeah, and that's, with... this is not nefarious. This is just like he. You'll have a um, you'll have a revelation. He writes a revelation that happened in 1830s from Joseph Smith after he's been recording things in 1843. So it's a little strange. Well, in this section here, in August 10, 1843, he writes some things. It's hard to read, but he's, uh, you know, he's with somebody, Elizabeth, between five or six, blah, blah, blah. Then the very next page, he's recording something that supposedly happened three months earlier. And that's the page that has the Kinderhook plate tracing on it. And then the very next page after that, we're back to October, October of 1843. And then we're the very page after that, we're in April of 1844. It's almost like he's recording smatterings of things. I don't know exactly why. It doesn't seem like a completely contemporaneous journal where you're recording daily. But the point of this is he, it's very possible in fact, most likely he did not record that on May 3rd, 1843. What he did oh, was sure. he maybe lifted that from another journal or he somehow traced that, which is identical to what Clayton traces. OK, well, but he didn't do it on the day. So does that mean that Clayton It's certain that Clayton recorded his on the day? Well, the problem is Clayton had access I, to papers. Uh, Go ahead. Well, the thing that just drives me crazy, and you maybe you're going to get to this, but from the time you very first showed it, what I think is so dumb is that someone recording something after doesn't prove that it was contemporary. I mean, like the fact that Clayton included a, contempt, a, a Kinderhook plate in a later production does not prove that it was an earlier production. It would be, I, I should go the other direction. It would only prove anything if he included the Kinderhook plate before it was available. Do you know what I'm like? That's, I guess what I'm saying is to, to include the Kinderhook plate later does not prove that it was earlier when he had seen the Kinderhook plate. That's so, I, I'm not explaining it well. Maybe you can explain it better, but it's so obvious to me. Well, on the day he says he records it, which is two days before Brigham supposedly records his, but remember, Brigham's is not on the day. Brigham's is sometime between August of 1843 and October of 1843. Oh, Jeremy, sometime. come on. You know everyone just opens the journal wherever <laughs> and writes Randomly right and then fills yeah. in around it. Exactly. Right. Well, That's how everyone does it. With Clayton, the, look. I can't prove when he wrote this. I don't know when he wrote it exactly. I have a, I have a, I have an idea of when he wrote it, but I don't know exactly when he wrote this particular page. But he could have written a long time after because we have newspaper articles from which he could have made a sketch, or he could have cut them out and traced around them because those newspaper articles were made from something called they're called woodcuts. 
We also had the woodcuts available. Apparently, the same person who made the woodcuts for the Book of Abraham and printed them in the newspaper. Those are actually, um, they cut the images out of wood and they, and they make etchings, say, so that you can then put ink on them and put them on a page. And then you have, uh, you have the image. That's what these, what you're seeing in these newspapers are made from wood cuts. They were made by a guy named Reuben Headlock, and apparently Joseph employed him to make the wood cuts of the Book of Abraham, or also employed him to make the wood cuts of these Kinderhook plates. They got printed in the Times, in, uh, sorry, the Nauvoo Neighbor, I believe it was. They got printed in the Prophet. So Clayton had access to something. Those, the, by the way, the plates were around till the Civil War. So they were available, they were around. We already know that Clayton was using his notes that he took. He could have made a note of it from anything at any time and included it in his later copy. That's what I'm saying. Like it goes, it, it, that is the dumbest claim to say, look, it includes something that he had 10 years before that proves that he made it 10 years before. That's so, I, I can't and Neither of us are proving. Neither of us are proving how or when he did it. And that's not the point. No, that's not the, the point. The point is they cannot say that this yeah, is that, proof that it was contemporaneous because it absolutely could have been done after the fact. Right. That's the point. The point. That does, they are completely wrong in saying that that proves that it was written. That That is laughably silly. So right. we can, so I think we can dispense with this, uh, Jacob Vadreen, if you're watching, you can no longer claim that this is contemporaneous. And Bill proof. Real. Bill Real's not <laughs> and, watching. And Bill them, Real. And all of them. And, so uh, dumb. If, if you want to see Brigham's there. journal, it's available. Just go look at it. So. And you know what? The fact that this is what they have as proof it shows us how silly this entire argument is. They keep saying, why do we even have to discuss this? It's so obvious. I think, no, the tables. Have this now is turned. why we have to discuss this. The, the tables have now turned where we should say, why do we even have to discuss your story? Stupid claims. This is Absolutely. so stupid. Why, why do we have to child. dignify? Why yeah, do we have to dignify your claims that it's contemporaneous? This is not. This no. is absolutely not contemporaneous. And for you to say so is is, well, it's in the face of evidence contrary to your claims. It should be embarrassing, and at some point it will be. I have a feeling I know which arguments will age better than others. So I think we can can we can definitively say this. You, you cannot say it's contemporaneous. I believe yeah. you can say it's not contemporaneous, but you certainly cannot say it is contemporaneous. We also know there's a private record. Where the heck is that thing? And also, finally, let's listen to James Allen's additional warning about the content of what is in the An Intimate Chronicle, the excerpts from Ehat's notes. He says the following. After having said scholars should be very wary, he says, the result, so far as an intimate chronicle is concerned, is an abridgment that leaves the worst kind of imbalance. It is not a scholarly abridgment based on a consistent rationale concerning what is important enough to include or insignificant enough to leave out. For example, Ehat's excerpts reveal some problems between Joseph and Emma, but the original journals show with equal clarity that the two were very close and very much in love. Clayton saw the problems, but he also saw the prophet and his wife working together for a common cause in a variety of ways. The excerpts largely obscure that fact. Then he goes through and he gives an example. I won't read it. He gives a beautiful example from the journals of how that looked to, to William Clayton even. My own analysis of the Ehat, Ehat excerpts show that they are reasonably accurate transcriptions of the original. Smith's reproduction, moreover, was generally faithful to the Ehat material. Nevertheless, the excerpts are highly selective. They usually include only a portion of a daily entry, and they do not constitute more than about 25% of the whole. For these reasons, I felt it important to warn prospective readers that Journal 2 is not a real abridgment based on the same const consistent rationale that governs Smith's abridgment of the other journals in an intimate chronicle. Rather, it is an often misleading agglomeration of unconnected and out-of-context excerpts. This is not a criticism of Smith's editing, for he did a good job with what he had before him. It is simply part of my concern over whether this journal should have been published at all in that form. Now, as you had said previously, he's an apologist for the church, and he didn't want them out because the church doesn't want them out. So that's one that's one thing to acknowledge. But I think it's also important to consider what he's saying. And also, this gives us an idea of why the church doesn't want these out. Because if Clayton is saying, on the one hand, 
in certain excerpts, they're having these tremendous problems. And on the other hand, they're very much in love. And the entire narrative that, that Emma is a psychopath, okay, is a psychopath seriously mentally challenged she's got she's got real a uh, real mental disorder okay that's what people I say will say it. that people actually claim that they actually I know. say that based they on get this it from this journal and almost exclusively mm -hmm. from this journal okay so when you have on the one hand them being very close and clayton recording that himself and on the other hand you have the psychopathy of Emma Smith on detail and Joseph's callousness on detail, which also that does appear. How do you balance those two? Well, Alan did not mention the following. James Allen did not mention that every single one of the polygamy references regarding Joseph and Emma, those happen to be in the gap book. What? Every single reference. So why is it that Clayton would create a second book? Why is it that he would stop in the middle of the first one and leave a 17 month gap before the very next entry? And that every single, um, uh, th that the gap that he, the gap book that he records in the second book contains all of the salacious material? Why would someone do that? Let's answer the question. Why would Clayton do that? Well, I think that's the idea that should be explored. That's the thing that James Allen should have been talking about and should have frankly let us all know in his warning because he knows how, that. How do you know that? How, is that from the pages Because I've gone through on... meticulously Robert Phillips' compilation. Okay, okay. And I've color coded them and I've marked them all up and I know exactly where all of them are. And they start the references to Joseph Smith with one teeny minor exception, but it's recorded in both books. It's at the very end, it's the, it's the marriage to Margaret Moon. He starts the gap book with his marriage to Margaret Moon. And he goes on from there. Okay. So you tell me why Clayton, little Willie, is recording these things there. So this gap book elicits some extremely important questions. Why in the first place would he leave the gap? You know, what what possible motivation? What reason? What, go back. What were the dates of the gap again? Just remind us. Okay. It's... So remember, the first book goes from 27 November 1842 okay. through 28 April 1843. These dates are so important. Then 20, Then the very next entry, is 25 September 1844. It's not death. like there were a bunch of pages torn out, people. There, there weren't mm -hmm. pages torn out. It's just the next entry, okay, is 25 September 1844 through 1845. Then the gap book, that covers 27 April 1843 through 24 September 1844. That gap that's in the first book. What possible motivation would Clayton have to put all the polygamy references related to Joseph in the gap book, okay? Also, given Alan's warning about the out-of-context excerpts from this book, by the, by the way, the out-of-context excerpts, excerpts are all from the gap book. Those out-of-context salacious ones are from the gap book. And the rest of Clayton's journal showing Joseph and Emma to be very close and very much in love, should we not be more skeptical about this record? Uh and I also have to say, James Allen, as the church apologist, very much on the church's side, giving this clear warning and yet the joseph smith historians all of the church historians a hundred percent rely on the william on this journal, journal for this is their, every one has told me it's it's the definitive source of joseph's polygamy it is the only thing they have and it's the only thing they use other than the later um affidavits which many of them had access to the clayton narrative as like why why, why anyone why anyone would ever say that without ever examining the the original without anyone being able to examine the original shows me this is why I call it historical malpractice shame on you all frankly for making Absolutely. those statements when by the way those of you who are historians you can do better work than I've done are you serious are you kidding me I don't know if they can their bias gets in the way it's insane that they are doing this their story gets in the way. Maybe it takes people that aren't 
trained by them in their malpractice to be able to address this. Maybe we need to have a different view of historians altogether now, especially since we have so much access to information. So finally, why why in the world would he would he would he make a clean, fair copy of his journals at all? Why would he do this? Well, Alan again helps us understand. I love James Allen. He just helps us understand because he inadvertently has written about this stuff. So as one of Joseph's scribes, he says, Clayton was on the committee that originally began to prepare Joseph Smith's history of the church for publication. Let that sink And that in. was after Joseph's death. That was in Utah. Correct. Indiana, He's correct? on okay. the committee. It is well known that much of this history was not written or dictated by Joseph himself, but rather with, this is not while Joseph's alive. He's not on the committee while Joseph's alive. He's recording lots. He's recording uh, deeds. He's recording tithing donations. He's not. And true revelations. Yeah. He's not, he's not part of the history. He's not following Richards around doing the history. It is well known that much of this history was oh, not oh, written you by mean Clayton. Okay, sorry, I was Clay Clayton was not following saying, Richards around. Clayton yeah. was not part of it. I got okay. Right. Um, uh, much of the history was not written or dictated by Joseph himself, but rather was based on journal entries of his scribes or other people. When these entries were made part of the history, the third person references to Joseph were simply changed. By the way, that stuff gets really, really wonky because they put things in Joseph's mouth that you can find nothing any, anywhere in the record that he actually said. So. That history is and problematic. Also, let's keep in mind, we have the very clear record of them absolutely changing sources and altering. Just the October 5th journal entry is probably the most infamous of those. So this committee was up to was up to a lot of mischief. Absolutely. And uh, other changes were made to the text, though they usually were minor. George Albert Smith and Wilfred Woodruff finished the work in 1856, published it serially. Clayton's Nauvoo journals were among the valuable resources for this history. For example, some of the revelations now included in the history of the Doctrine and Covenants were originally recorded in Clayton's journals. Uh, on the evening of February 19, 1843, I've already referenced this. That's the one where the spirits of just men made perfect are able to be detected. Um, the entry in Clayton's journal became practically verbatim, the entry in the history and later section 129 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Something similar is true for much of section 130, recorded in April 2nd, uh, 1843, as, a, as, a few, as well as a few other sections. William Clayton's Nauvoo journal is one of several sources that Clayton, Willard Richards, and others drew on when they were preparing Joseph's history of the church. The excerpts herein are most similar are most similar to the entries in the history. This material illustrates Clayton's importance in preserving the memory of Joseph Smith. In some instances, the Clayton diary was the only source for the entries in the history. In many others, it appears that the compilers also relied on different sources, but Clayton's journal still provided the greatest substance. Now, in I highly recommend, if you want to see this, just read, um, this is from James Allen's uh, No Toil Nor Labor Fear. Um, and at the end of it, no, sorry, this is uh, Clayton's uh, Clayton and the records of the church. At the end, he compiles all of the listings from Clayton's journal and where they find themselves in the history of the church. And there happen to be 69 instances from Clayton's journal pulled directly into the history of the church. That is not insignificant at all. So why and Clayton? It's pretty much all of the polygamy. He's the only source <laughs> for all. that. For that, yes, they don't they don't list a lot of the polygamy stuff necessarily in the history, um, because remember they weren't fully ready when they were documenting the history to let the cat out of the bag, as they said. Okay, they weren't ready ready to do that. So, and they were compiling this history starting in 1845. April of 1845 okay, okay. is when they begin. So they're not putting the polygamy stuff in. They're using Clayton's journal, the journal itself, for that. However. Clayton is obviously creating a clean, fair copy that can then later be used. We know, for example, this is from the Joseph Smith papers. We can see on the, in the image on the right, you can see this is in 1845. Um, from the JSP, they say Clayton uses used the Nauvoo Journal to record daily entries, da-da-da. Shortly after Clayton finished making entries in the volume, he apparently loaned or gave it to the church historian's office. And by winter 1845, 1846, the office staff had begun using the journal to work on Joseph's history. So the, they're already using this. So the timing, when did he write this? He wrote at least volume one because the entry you're going to see on the page is from volume one. Okay. Volume one was 
completed sometime by end of 1845 sometime beginning of 1846 because that's when they're using this journal it's in inventory volume one is okay the journal was listed in inventories that the church historian's office produced in the 19th century so we have it in inventories in 1858 and in 1878 so we know for certain clayton's journals are in inventory then but where they're referencing the journals whether he actually gives it to them permanently in 1845 we don't know but they're referencing the journals and the pages from the journals in 1845, as we can see on this page here, this is when Willard Richards and Thomas Bullock are working together to create what's called the history draft. Okay, It's a draft of what later becomes the official history. Bullock and Richards did that together. Okay, Richards is the primary historian. Bullock's is helping him. And you can see this is in Bullock's handwriting. It says Clayton's Journal, pages 53 and 54. They're referencing, um, there are there three panel? administrations, angel, spirits, and devils, when an angel, something appears. This is that's what becomes later section 129 of the Doctrine and Covenants. They record this in 1845. The, I point that out, I'm spending time on this, so you understand, he's working on this very likely at the same time he's working on the Council of 50 record. When did he start that? September 1844. Okay. In the same type of book that he's recording the journal in, very likely what he's doing, after Joseph dies, he starts to realize, oh my gosh, I have possession of some records that are important. Oh my gosh, I'm not even going to tell anybody. Oh my gosh, I better, I, better, I better make this thing look good. So he's recording the Council of 50 records, doesn't tell Brigham Young, doesn't tell Willard Richards. Remember, they start recording the history of the church in 1845. Does Clayton turn it over in 1845? Yeah. Not until 1847. No, Would Brigham Young have wanted that record? Yeah, so he could decide whether to destroy it or not, what to do with it. Brigham wanted to be in charge of all of it. He wanted, in fact... Uh, I'm going to read something from William Smith here in a second about that. So after Joseph's death, several of Clayton's journal entries were entered into Joseph Smith history. They became canonized sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. That's how important Clayton's journal is. Section 129, 130, 131, and of course, Section 132, which is not in his journal, just a reference. Clayton plays the important role, at least in the story, of how that comes about. Do you know what? I don't know if we know for, I'm just throwing this out there. We don't have all of the pages of the journal. We don't know for sure that 132 oh, no. wasn't in it as well. And I just, oh. on my last episode, Clayton did claim that he wrote the whole thing. And so it is just oh, yeah. possible. It's possible. We don't, we don't know because we don't have it. We don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know. So a di this is also a, another piece that's important. A different kind of problem arises from an account in the history that was reported to have come from Clayton's journal, but that actually did not, at least not from the journals now, uh, extant. Uh -huh. extant. On because May 18, 1843, uh -huh. Joseph Smith and William Clayton were in Carthage, where they dined with Joseph, Ju Judge Stephen A. Douglas at the home of Sher Sheriff Jacob Backenstos. Some of that conversation is recorded in Clayton's journal, but not the way it later appeared in the history. However, in putting the conversation in the history, the editors did not follow their usual pattern of entering whatever they could gather without citing the source. Instead, they took pains to state that the following brief account is from the journal of William Clayton, who was present. Uh, and he, they write it down. The question is whether this expanded version of Clayton's original entry, where it came from, if somehow it really came from Clayton, there are only two possibilities. One is that Clayton wrote it in a more in more than one journal that day, perhaps in a source that is no longer extant. The, the other is simply that Clayton, who was still working with the church historians when they were putting all this together, was asked about the prophecy and drawing on a vivid memory of the occasion provided the expanded account, because it's not in his journal. Mm. Okay. My point in bringing that up is it shows that he's working with the historians. They're saying it comes from his journal, but we don't have, it's not in his journal. So where did it come from? Another record? Did Clayton make it up? The point is this brings into question what other things Clayton was doing and the completeness, the accuracy, the veracity of what we call the Clayton journals. Okay, those are very important. Even when he was involved in important council meetings, Clayton's name was often left out of the official histories that chronicled those meetings. 
This plays into something we're going to talk about later. Brigham Young's history of April 28, 1845, for example, tells of a council attended by himself, Heber Kimball, John Taylor, Newell Whitney, where, quote, we read letters from Parley P. Pratt pertaining to his activities in the East. But Clayton was also at that meeting, and it was he who actually read Pratt's letters to the council. So they so don't even record that he's up? there. Why? <laughs> I think we're, I think, I think um, we're going to see here in a second. Okay, so what? So they use oh. the they use Clayton's journal for the history. Big deal. Who cares? So what? I mean, come on, right? Right? We need to understand Brigham Young's involvement in the revision of Joseph's history, as you've just mentioned. I'm just going to do a very hopefully quick re- rundown of just some of the things uh, that that we know for certain were revised. You know, I heard Bill Real say this the other day. Oh yeah, we know Joe uh, Brigham revised the history. And then and then he gave a strange example Stupid, of a of a quote revelation that Joseph Smith gives, which I believe there's a great wonderful explanation for. However, he doesn't mention any of this stuff. And Bill, please, would you at least be honest about this and actually acknowledge what Brigham Young actually did? By the way, if you guys want to see a detailed recitation, just go to Rob Fotheringham's discussion of this um, or go to Mark Curtis, who did a fantastic job with this on Hemlock Knots. So, uh, look these up on YouTube and and they give you a deep dive into these things. But just a brief thing on April 8th, 8, April 1st, 1845, Brigham says we've started the revision of Joseph Smith's history. Now, this is really important. William Smith says and summarizing that Brigham took over all of Joseph's papers in 1845. He, he just commandeered them. Uh, in contrary to the Smith family's um, claims for Joseph's property, they wanted Joseph's papers back, but Brigham took them all over as his own property. Now, why? So he could revise the history of the church. That's exactly why. That's actually super important because think of it. If your spouse dies, you get like you're his, you're the spouse, right? That's how mm-hmm. it should be. Brigham hadn't even settled the succession crisis like he had no business at all taking well they, they did possessions. they did settle that and, at the end of 1844 so that was that was done the 12 took over right. by that point and then they commandeered the papers okay okay they also though were trying i guess i guess what i should say is they didn't have unanimity they were not the recognized authority by everybody especially not by emma and they were desperately i've mentioned this before but i think it's worth mentioning again they were desperately trying to get the um the the bible translation which i think is really important to recognize the bible translation rob just did a great video on that as well in no way supports polygamy and in no way can supports 132 and i think they desperately wanted that so they could revise alter it as well and it's it's really important to look at what went through their hands and what didn't because those things tell a very different story so let me emphasize this from william smith it says what you're saying brigham young john taylor willard richards with the appointed bishops has have assumed the publishing of the church documents the book of covenants and also joseph's private history as their own property entirely regardless of the rights of the smith family as they're with connected Okay. It makes There's, me so angry. It makes me and, so angry what they did to Emma. Ugh. And why and and why did they want everything? And if Clayton was withholding something and they oh. knew about it, would they have let that stand? And okay. if they knew that he had withheld it, would they be happy with little Willie? Okay. The, that that question, historians, you should really look into. Richard Van Wagner has written extensively on this, and he's the one who said, uh, regarding the church's history in total, the introductory assurance that no historical or doctrinal statement has been changed is demonstrably long. wrong, which, by the way, that statement has been repeated in various forms by church leaders for generations. There's nothing wrong in the history. We've never lied about the stuff. We've never changed things. Nothing's been altered. Okay. He says, overshadowed by editorial censorship, hundreds of deletions, additions, and alterations, hundreds. These seven volumes are not always reliable. That's an understatement. The 19th Mm -hmm. century propaganda mill was so adroit that few outside Brigham Young's inner circle were aware of the behind the scenes alterations so seamlessly stitched 
into the history of the church. The Quorum of the Twelve under Brigham Young's leadership began altering the historical record shortly after Smith's death. Contrary to the introduction's claims, Smith did not author the history of the church. At the time of his 1844 death, the narrative had been written by Joseph himself only to 5 August 1838. Okay. There was nothing after 1838 that Joseph had his hands on. Charles Wesley Wandell, assistant church historian at the time in 1844, who had later left the church, who was, was aghast at these emendations, commenting on the many changes made to the historical work as it was being serialized, Wandell noted in his diary, I noticed the interpolations because having been employed in the historian's office at Nauvoo by Dr. Richards and employed too in 1845, in compiling this very autobiography, I know that at, I note I know that after Joseph's death, his memoir was doctored to suit the new order of things, and this too by the direct order of Brigham Young to Doctor Richards and systematically by Richards. That this revision That's such was sent, an important quote. That's it's an incredibly important quote important that everyone quote. overlooks and no one repeats, and they should repeat it ad nauseum, because this is why we we mentioned this. The false traditions of our fathers are what get us to lose light and truth. If we have been, we've, we've been told our history um, is, is one thing when in reality it was another. And this is demonstrably true. From, there are so many stories and so many, there are hundreds of deletions right. and insertions and, in the history. Yes. And even if it's not from a faith perspective where we're concerned about false doctrines and false beliefs, People should just care about truth. And about accuracy. what's true and what's not. Historians should have some amount of pride to There's... not just spout forth lies. They should at least want to get to the truth. I think There's that a... Don Bradley does that. He Don Bradley over, is, it, I, like, I can have a great conversation with him. Yeah. Don, Don is a fair-minded man. And mm -hmm. Harold B. Lee was a fair-minded man who said, look, I'm paraphrasing, but we our history can stand up to the truth it, yes. we should not be afraid of the truth and 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 if it's true we should want to know it basically that's my right. feeling if it's true and we if, should want to know it and if truth damages our narrative it ought to be damaged that's, that's what that, he said that's the that's other what part of what he saying. said yeah Continuing that this revision or censorship of the official history came from Brigham Young is evidenced by an 11 July 1856 reference in Wilfred Woodruff's diary. Apostle Woodruff, working in the church historian's office, questioned Young respecting a, quote, piece of history in Book E1, page 1681-2 concerning Hiram leading this church. By the way, you can see that on the Joseph Smith papers. And tracing the Aaronic priesthood. Young advised, quote, it was not essential to be inserted in the history and had better be omitted. As you, as you will see when you learn more about Brigham Young, he did not like Hiram at all. And he was threatened oh, no. by the memory of Hiram and was especially threatened by what people remembered about Joseph saying about Hiram leading the church and being mm -hmm. the heir to Joseph because Brigham did not want that in the record at all. Years later, Elder Char Charles W. Penrose, a member of the First Presidency, admitted that after Joseph Smith's death, some changes were made in the official record for, quote, prudential reasons. Okay, so there's too many references to, to, to enumerate, but we see in the history of the church, Brigham Young and in his manuscript history, his journal, talking about revising the history over and over and over. What do they mean by revising the history you know is it just well we're just you know we're just cleaning up a little bit no the revising of the history as it says in this particular document in the man, man, manuscript history to be revised okay this section mm -hmm. to be revised it meant actually changing the meaning of the documents as you referenced the october 5th 1843 journal entry from joseph smith where he's walking up and down the street street with his scribe and he says uh, about the preaching of the doctrine of the plurality of wives on this law. Joseph forbids it. He forbids it. No man shall have but one wife. But in the revised version, they change the meaning unless, unless I say it's okay. Okay. Unless I say it's okay, then you can't do it. That is, and Brian Hales gives, frankly, the, 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 the most inane the, argument I, I for like, that. My brain, I had to apologize to my brain after watching that. <laughs> And say, I'm sorry for subjecting you to that degree of idiocy. I don't even know 
how he thinks that is a logical explanation. I'm sorry to be, uh, but uh, and, and, yeah, you keep going because you might in, get to in, the ones I want to point out. Well, yeah? in the letter to the Relief Society on May, uh, yeah. March 31st, 1842, in the content, in the notes written by Eliza Snow of the meeting, Okay, where she records the letter that Joseph writes to the Relief Society. In that letter, he's responding to the nefarious stuff that John Bennett is doing. And John Bennett and Chauncey Higby and others that are going around def uh, 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 defrauding and defaming and, and, and deflowering, I suppose. They're, they're, they're abusing women, saying, Joseph told us we can do this. And, and Joseph makes it so abundantly clear that you cannot do any of those things and they will be damned and you will be damned if you follow them. And he says that uh, whether they're seers, revelators, patriarchs, 12 apostles, elders, priests, mayors, generals, city, city councilors, aldermen, marshals, police, Lord males, or the devil. He says, if any of these people come to you saying you can do this stuff, you can basically put them down. Um, uh, they're, they're culpable and damned yeah. for those practices. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's saying, I am not, I can't tell you these things and nobody can tell you these things, mm -hmm. but they change it. Now, the Joseph Smith paper says that the letter in Willard Richards handwriting was first, <laughs> was first for which they can provide absolutely no proof. It's a standalone letter. It has to it, be that way. But it, it happens has to, be that to make way to make their sense. Of course it does. It happens to make the same exact editorial change as what we saw with the journal entry. The exact same change. Uh don't listen to anybody saying this stuff unless it be by message delivered to you by our own mouth. Unless we say so, then you can't do it. Okay. Go mm -hmm. read that on the Joseph Smith papers and see how they twist themselves in knots to try to make Joseph secretly doing these things while saying another thing publicly. Polygamy we, doctrine. So Joseph and Hiram consistently, repeatedly said, the standards in the scriptures, the long traditional, those are what you follow. The polygamist morality is always follow those unless God or your leader says otherwise. Precisely. That's the consistent line that we always find between the two versions. Which which follows itself into the happiness letter, for example. That every same, single, every that same single crazy source. notion. Then we have uh, Hiram's 18, uh, April 8th, 1844 talk, which he just rails on plural marriage, pl uh, polygamy, spiritual wifery for an hour and a half. A fiery sermon. I just read extensively from that in my last episode. Yep. And so the audience knows about this. And of course, they took it out of the draft and then they took it out of the pre-publication history. They just crossed it out. They just crossed it out. And then when well, it came first, to actually... First, they changed it. First, they tried to make those they editorial, tried to, editorial changes. Correct. They tried to make changes it to it, but it didn't even work. So they crossed it out. And then by the time it made it to the history, there's nothing there except many other remarks were made by the speaker. Yep. <laughs> And, and and an interesting thing I just found in that also, Hiram said in that, speaking of eternal marriage, he doesn't say exactly the same wording, but it's basically, it's so plain, I could make any man understand it. Correct. That was fascinating. He's talking. That show up in William Clayton's version of polygamy, just like... Joseph said, according to many references, if Brigham ever led the church, he would lead it directly to hell. Brigham transforms that to be about somebody else, right? But the same wording. I find it fascinating how they did this so that there was enough recognition that people would buy it maybe, but it was changed to fit the new order of things. Again Absolutely. and again, you find these patterns. What I, what, I, what I would love to see is Brigham Young, who was on the stage while he's giving that sermon. I'd love to see Brigham Young's face. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then we have in July 18th, 1856, I called upon President Young, read a piece of history book. He won. I referenced this previously, but this is the reference in um, from Wilford Woodruff's journal where he's recording that Brigham Young doesn't want certain things about Hiram to be put into the, the official history. And then we have a, a document that says not to go in by BY's orders. This is also about Hiram leading the church. That's that same reference that I just mentioned. And then, of course... Yeah. There is this really interesting reference where he says, I spent the day in, pre this is Wilford Woodruff, and President Young was with us three and a quarter hours in hearing history. Um, read, he asked if there had been any note made of the, his meeting in Nauvoo at Joseph's house. Now, <laughs> in a previous episode talking about Brigham and Heber, I read from 1866 where Brigham Young gives this 
long recitation of this meeting he went to at Joseph's house where Hiram was there preaching about the importance of the canon of Scripture, and that if anyone preaches anything contrary to the canon of Scripture, you can set him down as an imposter. And then Joseph buries his head in his hands. <laughs> yeah, we've As though about he's this one. terribly embarrassed and says to Brigham, get up. You correct the record, Brigham, basically. And Brigham does correct the record and says, I wouldn't give the ashes of a rice straw for all the scriptures in the world without the living oracles. Okay. And then Hiram, so embarrassed, gets up and begs the congregation for forgiveness. Okay. This is a story he tells in 1866. Well, this is what he's referring to um, here in 1856. Okay. This is while they're revising the history. So, um, at the time Hiram had preached the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants as the standard, while I took the ground that there were, they were of no account to us without a living prophet and revelation, I told him we would examine and see. Well, uh, there that did not make it into the documentary history of the church. That story, they couldn't figure it, they couldn't find it. So Brigham in 1866, 10 years later, because by the way, in 1856, they started publishing it. They start publishing the history of the church in serial form. They couldn't find the reference, so they didn't add it in 1856. In 1866, he gives a speech. Says, oh, let me tell you what actually happened. Okay, And guess what? It finally found, it found its way into the history, into the book Saints. So unfortunately, the same kind of chicanery nonsense is going on now. They, oh, absolutely. 100%. In fact, the, in, in Saints is the altered version of Hiram's speech, references from that. They, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely continuing strong to this. Day. And in this one, they don't say, according to Brigham Young in 1866, mm -hmm. who they gave a sermon uh, recalling what had happened back in 1843. No, 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 no. What they say is, Brother Brigham, they just quote it as though it's happening contemporaneously, as though it's happening on the day. That's the kind of stuff that I find to be historical malpractice. And I think it's got to stop. The happiness letter is another one. We won't go into this, but the happiness letter um, was originally dated 2nd of August, 1842. It was published by John Bennett. Uh, it was he who claimed it was in the handwriting of Willard Richards, uh, but it was entered into the manuscript history um, yeah. in an addendum. Yeah. We, we, so I wanted to point out, this was surprising to me. We have no version of this other than what John Bennett printed in the Sangamo Journal. We don't we have don't the original. We don't have a letter from Willard Richards. We don't no. have anything other than John Bennett's claims. And while they cut Hiram's speech out, they actually included John Bennett, the guy who was plotting mercilessly to have Joseph Smith destroyed. They included him in the history. That's insane. M meanwhile, That's insane. Joseph... Sidney Rigdon and Nancy Rigdon, the subject, the, the woman about whom the whole, the whole subject was uh, what was framed, they all denied it was uh, it was from Joseph. Um, Bennett's claims were never corroborated, and it was also published in the teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. That's Even the kind the of the Sangamo Journal was asking Bennett to get the women to write um, affidavits to get it firsthand from them, and so they were asking him for that, and he still couldn't come through. Now, to their credit, the editors of the JSP today, they doubt the connection of the happiness letter to Joseph Smith, and it's no longer published in the history of the saints. So at least there's that. At least That's, it hasn't so continued and and made its way into but, the into the current history. But it's so gaslighting because they haven't corrected it. No. They just pretend it never happened. No, they they, they, they still leave room for maybe, maybe it is, but at least they doubt it. At least there's a little progress it's there. It's been quoted and, in general conference multiple times. Uh, I will say that. And I'm not blaming our church leaders. They're not the historians. They're just using the sources that they've been given by the historians. And then, of course, there's Lucy Max history. Brigham wanted all the copies destroyed. Okay, he was really mad because Orson Pratt published an independent copy on his own, and he wanted that whole thing swooped up because, well, because it favored Hiram and it said some good things about Emma. It didn't Who go knows? along the new order of things. It didn't. It didn't. It, it didn't do exactly what Brigham wanted, according to modern historians. Lucy's history tests extremely well. Uh, Brigham mm -hmm. said she was an old woman. She had she lost her memory. She wasn't reliable, and she was uh, spewing. He calls it um, uh, transmitting lies to posterity. And I know that the curse of God will rest on everyone who keeps these books in their houses. I mean, he just he he spent an entire speech 
in front of the congregation talking about this and 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 chastising all the members of the church and and demanding that they all be rounded up. In in another of the many brilliant examples of complete projection, right? Brigham accuses Lucy of teaching lies about the history of the church, the posterity of the church. Brigham accuses Lucy of doing that when that is exactly what Brigham And, and was according doing to all evidence, she was she was very sharp in her last years. Very oh, sharp. Yeah. And then of course we have as we've mentioned, the strange journals, uh, journals, the, the memo books by Willard Richards, which why would anyone add to the journals? Why would anyone after Joseph's dead, not Richards himself, write in the journals like Thomas Bullock did, for example? And by the way, these references, the things that are added are about polygamy oh, <laughs> or about gosh. or about posthumous or about ceilings that took place or about. Uh, uh, some some plural marriages that took place. Bullock recording some of them, for example. Um, oh boy, my computer is not loading as fast as I'd like it to. So you see, he's he's listing a whole bunch of marriages Bullock does, and he does it. This is long after in the 1850s. Then you have somebody else writing, and this is not Richards. Um, also, some things about um, uh, marriages. Um, Let's see, an anointing uh, entered in by Brigham Young, President of the Twelve. Why would anybody do this? Why would you write into a journal unless you were doing something to alter the history? Then we have John Bernheisel, who records a whole bunch of ceilings. These are really, really strange. So this whole pattern. Um, oh, and of course, he leaves the, the hundreds of pages blank. And I think we can see why, because he meant to add things later. And after he died and Richards died in 1854, okay, people were adding things after he died. I think he meant to add things to it, but people took up the mantle after he died in 1854 and they started adding things to the journal anyway. <laughs> also, there are sermons that Joseph preached that we don't have. Uh, according to Joseph Smith himself in the in the Nauvoo City Council, or sorry, High Council minutes in the trials of the women who testified against Chauncey Higby and John Bennett and others. One of the things that some of the that one of the women asked Chauncey Higby was, "Why does Joseph preach so much against what you're teaching me?" Mm -hmm. Okay, and Joseph says, "When I asked why I publicly preached so much against it, wait, publicly preached against what John Bennett was doing. Where are those sermons? Why don't we have those?" Mm -hmm. Okay, and then that pattern continued on for decades afterwards, creating questionable affidavits with legalistic language like married or sealed, with glaring inconsistencies, many with no notary seal, some with outright falsehoods like my great, great, great grandfather, Thomas Grover, legal testimonies fraught with inconsistencies and provable lies, later memoirs with glaring omissions, inconsistencies like Joseph Kingsbury and Elizabeth Whitney and Emily Partridge, editing letters like Andrew Jensen did with the, the daughter of Elvira Coles, lying before Congress like Joseph F. Smith did. This pattern started by Brigham Young of altering the history and lying about what happened, started with him and continued on well into the early 20th century. I the love the quote by Emma Smith when she told Brigham Young, the first two principles of your gospel are lying and deceit. It's absolutely it's true. exactly right. The revising of Joseph's history was a critical part of Brigham Young's administration, and William Clayton played a key role but not necessarily one that Brigham liked. Remember that William did not tell Brigham about the Council of 50 record for over, for at least two years after Brigham bega began the revision of Joseph's history. Would he have been happy about that fact or would Brigham have been furious? Now, remember what we said on the same day that Clayton tells Brigham that Stout's threatening to kill him, he delivers up the record. That's interesting. So, On the so same was day. Brigham, are you thinking that Brigham put Stout up to killing Clayton as a way to get the record from him? I have I have no I, idea. That's that would be that that would be a, a bridge too so far. So we don't we don't know you're not making but a point of that. Here's what we can say. Again, thank you to James Allen. Okay. Much changed for Clayton after 1847. He was never as close to the center of power as he had been in the days of Joseph. No longer was he the prophet's official scribe and bookkeeper. Though for a time he worked in Brigham Young's office and kept some of the financial records of the church, he also performed the duties of historian or clerk as periodically assigned. 
In 1852, he went on a mission, though he was released early because of accusations against him. I'm putting that in brackets, okay? He was released early from his mission. Well, we're going to learn more about that in the next episode. But okay, after just the- like James White had accused him of... He, he was accused of a lot of a he lot was of accused of theft. Of he was people. accused of all kinds of things. And, and Clayton records a lot of those accusations. We're going to read those in the next episode. But after that, okay. it appears he stood progressively further outside the prophet's inner circle. Though Clayton continued to preach in public meetings and take care of mis- miscellaneous tasks at the request of church leaders, he frequently found himself looking backward, longing for his former closeness to the seat of power, and in particular, the intimate friendship with the men of power that he... Uh, once enjoyed as one of Joseph's right-hand men. For some reason unexplained in the records, William Clayton had fallen out of favor with Brigham Young some months before his mission. In addition, Clayton's correspondence suggests that he had made some personal, though unspecified, mistakes that, that he wanted deeply to overcome. In the footnote in this paper that he's writing, he says, in this footnote seven, the main indication of this is in a letter from Clayton to Young, January 9th, 1852. Brigham Young papers in which Clayton discussed very formally some aspects of Young's accounts and says, but if it were lawful and I were not so far fallen beneath your confidence, I would suggest a few ideas which to me look just and right. He closes the letter, yours in the depths of sorrow, William Clayton. Mm. The tone of part of the letter of October 1840 1852 quoted frequently here also suggests a former falling out with Brigham Young. Why James Allen cannot connect the 1847 incident with the Council of 50 records is frankly beyond me. And we're going to discuss more about the falling out between Brigham Young and William Clayton in the next episode, because this is very important to understand. So 1847, he finally delivers up the records the day after he tells Brigham Young that Jose is trying to kill me. And Brigham says, you got 30 minutes, go. I delivered the records of the kingdom of Brigham Young. Could they be connected? I think they are. I think they are. I think somehow Clayton used that. This is is me opining. For those historians out there, I'm opining now. I am stating my opinion and not fact. But I believe that Clayton used that as leverage to somehow get him out of a very sticky situation. Because Brigham Young never forsook Hosea Stout. He kept him employed and kept him very close because he was an essential part of his uh, paramilitary or police force. Okay. And so Clayton had a reason to keep the journal secret, and then he had a reason to give it up. I believe it's because he was in trouble and he needed to give those records up to Brigham. Do you think that his reason, what do you think his reason was for keeping it secret? Was it, was it to keep it in his back pocket, back pocket in case he got in trouble? Do you see, think he was doing a service for them that they were, that they'd be so happy to, like, what was his reason for keeping them and doing it? You see in his journal, many references to him being on the outside looking in. You see him not being on the inner circle. What you see is a man trying to be on the inner circle and very upset at times that he's not. The wannabe. That's why I call him the wannabe. Yeah. He's absolutely a wannabe. And I believe that he knew he had something important. And for whatever, we don't maybe, know exactly why. But but maybe why do if you. He got to write the history, he could shape it as he wanted to regarding himself. Or maybe it was a way to be important. Or he could use okay. it later at a time when he needed it. Or he. Okay. Because a, a record, the Council of 50 is an incredibly important event in church history. It's incredibly important. And Clayton knew it. Okay. okay. He absolutely knew it. That's why he was making the record. And that's the only reason. That's the only reason we have any record of that organization. Other than a very few, two or three, four notes, minutes that, that have survived. That's all. Because okay. of Clayton's Just clear quickly, copy. Do- do you find the Council of Fifty records to be accurate and reliable? Because there's no way. There's there's absolutely no way to know. Okay. B- because as the Joseph Smith papers explained, they tell us how he made it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Clearly that that right. he's he's so reconstructing I, I would, events. In general, with Clayton, at, just like with Bennett or others, my perspective is kind of if I can verify what he said, 
then I'll accept it if it aligns with other things. But if it's just him, I'm gonna just I, do a hands up. I think I think if I think if we're being fair, we should be skeptical about anything recorded after the event, especially from people who have proven themselves to not yeah, be trustworthy. Him. Right. Correct. Now. Right. Okay. Uh, I think we can read it for what it is. It's a fair copy written afterwards. We don't have the original minutes. We don't know exactly what happened on the day. That's By all. a guy who is very unreliable, very motivated, who we've already shown to be extremely dishonest as it serves him for Correct. whatever reasons he has. Okay. Can now, I continue on. At his own funeral, this is what Joseph F. Smith and John Taylor said about William Clayton. And they were the next generation, so he was still on the outs. It, it handed down. And, okay. So imagine, imagine something like this being said about you or your father. Naturally, this is Joseph F. Smith. Naturally, he was concerned about how he might fare in the next life. That's a good way to start. Naturally, he was concerned. Mm -hmm. If he could have listened to the church leaders who spoke at his, his oh, this sorry, this is um, this is Alan. I'm sorry, this is Alan uh, about to quote them. Um, if he could have listened to church leaders who spoke at his funeral, he would have been comforted. James, I don't know why in the world you use that term, because this is what they said. Quote, he was not without his faults in the flesh, said Elder Joseph F. Smith. But what were they? Were they such as partook of a deadly character? Did he ever deny the prophet Joseph, or did he deny the truth or prove unfaithful to his covenants or to his brethren? No, never. But notwithstanding his unflinching integrity and his long life of fidelity, fidelity and usefulness, let me say to you that as for his faults, however trivial or important, he must answer. But he will be able to pay for his debts and to answer for his failings. And he will come forth, and all that has been pronounced upon his head by Joseph Smith and the apostles will be confirmed upon him throughout all eternity. Oh, my word. This Whoa. is about a dead man at his own funeral in front of his family. Wow. Then, then let me say to the family of our deceased brother, follow in the footsteps of your husband and father, excepting where he may have manifested the weaknesses of the flesh. Imitate his staunch integrity to the cause of Zion and his fidelity to his brethren. Be true as he was true. Be firm as he was firm. Never flinching, never swerving from the truth as God has revealed it to us. And I will promise you in the name of the Lord that you will rise to meet your husband and father in the morning of the first resurrection, clothed with glory, immortality, and eternal lives. Okay. In the same wow. spirit, the new leader of the church, John Taylor, sanctioned El Elder Smith's remarks and added, if there were any weaknesses in him, pass them by and live for God and for truth. He will be all right. So he tried to soften it a little bit. Can you imagine? Can you imagine John Taylor, the president? This, sorry, this is 1879. So yes, the president of the church and Joseph F. Smith, apostle. Let's speaking this, about you in that fashion at your funeral yeah or even it was even on the more local level we you know when we do funerals in the lds world the bishop is the final speaker so what if you were at the funeral of a loved one or whoever it was and all of a sudden the bishop got up and started doing these kind of jabs and the underhanded like how would you feel about that that's insane you only do that if you despise someone it, absolutely despise someone because yeah that's their funeral so given what we know about Brigham's efforts to control all of Joseph's papers and revise the history, would Brigham have been bothered by Clayton's withholding the Council of 50 record? I think absolutely. absolutely. I think that's He'd where it began. Livid. James Allen, he had a falling out with Brigham Young, but I think it happened sometime probably even before 1847 because he wasn't even in the mix. And I think that's mm -hmm. why he delivers the records up in 1847. Given and Williams maybe he role, was doing the records to try to get his way back in. That's bingo. Mm -hmm. He if had something this, he knew that they would want. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. They didn't know. They didn't know how close or what he was really to Joseph Smith, I believe. They didn't know he was doing all these. They didn't know what records he was keeping. Well, mm -hmm. given William's role, especially through the journal and shaping Joseph's history, and given that he would eventually lose favor with Brigham Young, is it possible that he would have a motive to fabricate any of the stories? Remember 
what we said about the rules of evidence. You have to prove it's a contemporaneous record. You have to prove it's trustworthy, that the person writing it is trustworthy. I think we're proving, we've proved number one, it's not contemporaneous, or you cannot mm -hmm. say it's contemporaneous. I know, I, I think we can say we've proven that it's not contemporaneous. I think, I think we are I... proving, the, uh, and in the next, we're gonna prove inconsistencies. We're gonna prove about his, we've already been examining his character. He is not a trustworthy individual. Mm -mm. He wrote the clean copy from his journal on the very, oh, there are possibilities, by the way, that number one, here, let me acknowledge, he wrote this clean copy. You cannot say anything but that it's a clean copy from his journal, from his original journal on the very same day or shortly thereafter. But if so, how do we account for that gap book? And, and so how do possible. we account for the consistency of the entries and the penmanship? Well, it's, it, it is possible that he went a week, right? Wrote his journal and said, I just need to, I need to clean this up. So while he's recording the next week's entries, he's going back and recording while he's doing all of his other work, by the way. Okay. Yeah. He's recording a clean copy at the okay. time. Okay. He wrote it sometime after, but it is a true, fair, or exact copy of the original. But if so, then what about that gap book? Where's the rough gap book as well? Okay. He wrote it after, I think the most logical, the most consistent, he wrote it after Joseph Smith's death. He used it to create a narrative to support, quote, the new order of things. This, ex this explanation accounts for Clayton's pattern of creating records. It accounts for the fair copy nature of the journals. It accounts for the situation Clayton was in with Brigham Young and Clayton's possible motive. And it also perfectly accounts for the strange gap book with all of the Joseph Smith polygamy references. It's the only consistent narrative is that he did it afterwards and he invented things and put them in the gap book. <laughs> now, could it be considered an authentic um, daily record in a court of law? <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It would be thrown out. We would not admit it in, in, in any courtroom in the country. Absolutely. And it would also, the, right now, because we they will not release these, I don't know why they're taking so long. I suspect the reason they're taking so long is they have to try to account for the anomalies that James Allen has, um, ha has admitted to. They have to account for the gap book. They have to count what the, what I believe they're going to do is in all the references in the journal, they're going to have to have a footnote that ties every reference to a later affidavit or story from somebody later. So people can then read back and forth and go, oh, of course, uh, he's telling the truth. Instead of reading it the other way, the affidavits and the later stories used that Clayton journal as the foundation, the foundation. for yeah. their later stories. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's why they're, that's my speculation. I could be wrong. Now, given what we've demonstrated that on that, the one singular piece of what you could have legitimately called contemporaneous evidence is proven to be neither contemporaneous nor evidence. Given what mm -hmm. we've demonstrated about Brigham and Heber's activities in England, and that they believed in and practiced spiritual wifery, plurality of wives, long before Joseph ever could have introduced it to them, given all the other inconsistencies and lies in the record. Please, to all the commentators, to all the historians, please be more humble and less certain about your pronouncements regarding Joseph and polygamy. Let me offer some humility, too, in this regard. If you can provide evidence and proof, direct evidence and proof, I will give this up. I will give it up, and I will admit that you're right. But until you do that, you need to be more humble about what you're saying. We're the ones that are already on record as following the evidence and changing our minds. I've said repeated, I've said before that I have publicly, to my detriment, changed my perspective on things multiple times. You because did it because of evidence. You did it. You you changed in the middle of a podcast that was the other way, and midstream. Was, right, and before that, I had. A bit of a, I used to teach and, and people really liked me because I believed polygamy was of God. Mm -hmm. I believed that thoroughly. And some of the people who liked me the most then hate me the most now. Yeah. And so I, I just want to point out that we are the ones on record following the evidence, 
despite the personal cost. I would like to see the other, and then the other side are the ones casting aspersions at us, saying that we're just guilty of motivated reasoning. I find that to be so highly offensive in my own personal situation because it is there. It is provably false. Their side does not have the same record I have of being willing to follow the evidence and change my stance for the sake of truth, despite the cost. I understand when you've mm-hmm. staked your claims and you built your reputation and you've you've given yourself a speaking tour, you've written books and sold books, um, or, or or you have become you've had notoriety because of some work you've done in a certain vein. That it's very difficult to give that up. I'm making no money off this, and I never will. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm doing this because I believe Joseph has been maligned. I believe. I believe first and foremost that the historical record doesn't support this. And number two, having looked deeply at Joseph Smith, his life, his character, his work, that this man is extraordinary. He is an extraordinary figure in United States history and world history, an extraordinary religious figure, and someone that I frankly look up to because of the magnanimity of his soul. He is an extraordinary man. He's not Jesus Christ. And he himself will say that. Do not look to me, he will say. He said, do not think I I am a righteous man, he said. He would acknowledge his faults, but he would direct people to Christ. And the things he would say, that he said to people, the things he taught, they are absolutely worthy of examination. And because of this nonsense, too many people cannot look at those things that he actually did and said. And so what I'm hoping is that we can re-examine those things from a fresh perspective, divorcing ourselves of this notion that he was fork-tongued, double-minded, a liar, because he was not. And I have to throw in, and I'm sorry, but you know my stance. I've repeated this also many times. For me, it's Emma. Of course. I, the, of course. I agree with you on Joe. The, the more I read of Joe, I, I had to overcome some hard feelings toward Joseph Smith. I'm still working on some yeah. of them to some extent. I'm still a little bit um, a little bit reserved in my effusive praise of him. Although the more I see of him, sure. the more astounded, the more I love him. I will say that, although that's a hard thing for me to say because it's come from so far. But dang it, Emma. The way that William Clayton talks about her, the way that Brigham Young talked about her, the way that, and and I think also it's Emma and it's also woman. It's women. It's how does God view women? How would a servant of God view women, treat women, talk about women? What is woman's place in the kingdom? And that's, so, so I do acknowledge that we both have a big old dog in this fight at this point based in what we have learned because of the evidence. You didn't start out just having this respect for Joseph Smith. And I didn't start out being so incensed by these false sexist claims against, I mean, Joseph Smith, absolutely. Emma Smith, every every step with him in importance and in virtue and sanctity and goodness and in mission from God. And so the two of them together need to be redeemed. And if you want to say, we need to, I'm so sick to death of people saying, believe the women, listen to the testimonies of women. You can't claim Dang it, listen to Emma Smith, listen to Lucy Mack Smith, listen to Catherine Smith, listen to um, all of Joseph's sisters, listen to any number of women who were telling the truth. And if you want to talk about these other women, I, I will at some point go through all of their testimonies, all of the just silliness of the things that they claimed. And so anyway, I think that both of these all of these people deserve an honest examination, not based in, I, I know that we say that like anti-Mormons and ex-Mormons now say that Mormons are just defending their sacred cows. Like we're just defending Joseph Smith because we have to. It is exactly the opposite. They will ignore all of the evidence and harp on it because their sacred cow is that Joseph was a pedophile, predator, the, uh, all, uh, womanizer, and all of these things. And it, that is where the motivated reasoning comes into play. That it's is where there. they are unwilling to engage in honesty and an honest consideration of the evidence. There are many There are many people who've left the church who had to fight really hard with their traditions and to try to figure out what their experiences were all about. And now they've gotten to a certain place and they're unwilling 
to consider it from a new angle because of the fight they had to engage in in order to get where they are, to be somewhat at peace about where they are. I understand why presenting this stuff is simply untenable to those people because it make it forces them to realize I made a decision partly on wrong information. Mm-hmm. I made a decision decision about my faith experience based on bad information. You mean Joseph Smith wasn't this kind of guy? What does that say about what what I was told about the Book of Mormon or about the Book of Abraham or about the treasure digging or whatever whatever the narrative is that you at want to least, pull out of your hat? At least be open up to reexamination, right? When you when you rejected the church, I, 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 the church is the wrong term. When you rejected the gospel, the Book of Mormon, and connection to God, you had to grapple with. But what did that spiritual experience mean that I had? And how can I explain this piece of it? And people had to find ways to explain all of those things. Well, those things are still there, not explained well, right? You can still re-examine and maybe bring things back. Like I know people were so angry at feeling lied to. The fact is you've been lied to. You've still been lied to. The CES letter is the biggest, fattest lie you can imagine. The CES letter is is a wet paper bag. All you have to do is examine it and it falls apart. Mm-hmm. It's just that simple. It's, and it's a narrative built on the false church narrative. It's layers of falsehood. Yes. yes. So hopefully this has been a little bit helpful today. And Look, we both Michelle and I are really passionate about this subject, and hopefully, hopefully, those of you who are who find yourselves as ex Mormons or out of the church, or you understand that we're not trying to get you to come back to anything to the church, only to know the truth about this history. If you want to decide something about your relationship to the Book of Mormon or to God, that's up to you. But please understand that you have not been given the full story about Joseph Smith and polygamy from John DeLynn, from Radio Free Mormon, from Brian Hales, from Todd Compton. They have told you things that either they knowingly know are not correct or they're passing on things that are absolutely false and they don't know it. And I hope I hope people like John DeLynn will watch this and other things that Michelle's done that other people are doing, and they will come to their senses and recognize this is not as cut and dry as they've painted it out to be. And so in conclusion of today's episode, oh, please go ahead before we wrap up. Just quickly, I want to give an exit path for those who are bound and determined to hate the church because of the difficult experiences they had and the betrayal they felt. You still can. If what you really want to do is hate the church, you still can hate the church, right? Because the fact is, it is Brigham Young and it, those people got control of it and your experiences are valid. The, the problems in the church are valid. You just don't have to blame the wrong guy to still keep that tradition. And for people who are in the church, who are where I am, you can keep your faith. You can keep connection to the beauty in the gospel and in the church while recognizing there were huge, huge problems. The idea is to not be a partaker of the problems anymore. So I guess what I'm saying is wherever you are and wherever you want to be, accepting the truth doesn't need to be a threat. And when you actually take Joseph, if you can just start neutrally on him, you know, not yeah. even that he's an honest man, just start neutrally. And you can go and read, go read, try the spirits, go read some of the, the sermons he gave to the Relief Society, go, go read the King Follett discourse, go, go read his, his sermon on July 16th, 1843 on, on eternal marriage. Go and read through the things that we can verifiably say came from him, not the not the strange things that were altered and edited by him or by others that, that found their way into the scriptures. Not those things, not the things that came after his death. Start with him. You might find something different, maybe even extraordinary. And so mm-hmm. in and conclusion, if you're too triggered by Joseph, <laughs> you can start with Emma. I'm no, I'm serious. For those Absolutely. Who are too triggered by Joseph, watch my episode on Emma. You can start there. You can read the narrative, read the things that William Clayton said about Emma, read the things that Brigham Young said about Emma and see how that sits with you genuinely. Then read about Emma's actual life. That's another place to start. If the Joseph Smith place is too high because it's too triggering, which I understand. 
And and if if you are one of those people and you got all the way through this, man, I applaud you. Yeah. <laughs> I really applaud you Go for ahead. sitting I'll through this. I'll let you conclude now. <laughs> well, as we've shown today, Clayton's history shows a clear pattern of manufacturing records, or at least embellishing them, or at least copying them from other sources into other ones. He had every opportunity to manufacture his journal. His Nauvoo journal, especially compared to the Council of 50 records, shows all the signs of being a later edited copy rather than an authentic daily journal. Clayton kept other records that are now not now public, like Clayton's private book or private journal. All of the polygamy references regarding Joseph and Emma are in that gap book. And William's relationship with Brigham proves he had ample motive to fabricate his gap book journal. Clayton's journal is a clean, fair copy, a later creation, and cannot be said to be a contemporaneous journal or diary. And frankly, the other side has got the burden of proof. So the only final question is, who do you choose to believe? If you will stick with this, if you're on the other side still, I promise you, there's a lot more to come. If you will stick with this subject, you still probably have lots of what about, well, what about, well, what about? There, Those things, we will examine them. I always say, please list them in the comments. Let's keep the conversation going. That's where we find truth. I love it when people bring to me a problem that I haven't, or a source that I haven't yet investigated, because I want the truth. I want to find, I don't want to leave any stone unturned. Continue. When yeah. you get to the bring point them. where where you can hear everything that Hales or Bradley or Compton or any of the critics talk about related to Joseph Smith, and you can understand that the narrative surrounding name your pet thing falls apart when you examine it closely. When you can get to that point, you will understand that it is not what they say. And it looks very different. And you just might come to the point where you actually believe Joseph. Wow. Okay. This was a marathon and it was amazing. So worth the long um, wait and the many the, the many false starts and the the price we paid. I hope that people will appreciate because I think this was an incredible presentation. I know it was a lot, everybody. I thank you for sticking with us. I, Jeremy, I'm excited to have you come back on. I so appreciate this incredible work that you've done. I really appreciate that the te the testimony that you share. It's good for me to hear it every time. Because I'm not, you know, I, I'm still working my way through all of this. It's tough. It's tricky. There is a lot of damage to overcome based on the things that we've been told, you know, and it's hard. I understand. I understand that it's hard to trust again, but I love hearing you say it and I love the invitation and I think it is so worthwhile. Well, I appreciate so that. And, and hopefully I love the work that you're doing. I think it's so important that people, um, just pursue the truth. And I'm so grateful that you're doing that. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody. We will see you next time. For those of you who are still here, you are amazing. Well done. Wow, that was quite a bit. But I did love a lot of the discussion we had. And there was so much incredible information here. I hope you agree with that. So well done. Go ahead and leave a comment letting us know that you made it to the end because I think there should be some sort of award <laughs> presented to all of you who stuck in this entire time. But um, I am so excited to continue to bring forward this information. I think it's so important and I look forward to our next episode. I'll see you next time. <laughs>